Hello. <clears throat> Hello, glad you could join. I'm afraid this isn't going to be a very exciting sitting. I'm going to be working mostly on this drawing of the basket. It might be exciting. I mean, I'm not going to speak for you, but <laughs> it's going to be a little on the slow side. So this to this point, there was only just a loose estimate of the basket weave. And on this sitting, I'm going to develop it. It's going to start with just a very cursory drawing. And this is very consequence free because um, it's just glazes. And glazes can just be wiped right off to a dry painting. So, um, you know, if there's any conflicts with the way the shapes fit together, I can just wipe them right off and try it again. And that's, uh, that, that was designed very intentionally. So it might take a little while for anyone to see where I'm going with this though. That's, that's the downside of these later sittings is, um, in the beginning stages, the, the painting just I mean, just every every brushstroke is a big impact. And right now, the shapes are getting smaller and smaller, and the impact is getting less and less. So Oh, I wish my hand weren't going right in the way of the camera. Hmm. What should I do about that? So far, so good with um, my first round of guessing for the spacing of these little slats. Okay. Welcome, welcome, whoever joined. It just says uh, iPhone, so... I don't really know. Since I like the orientation of these drawing lines so much, and I don't really want to thoroughly confuse anybody, like I kind of know where I'm going with it, but it doesn't really look like anything yet. I'm just going to go ahead and go a little bit early with my delineation of the weaves from these drawing lines like i really wouldn't have to if i'm just painting for me but i also appreciate you all looking um and i don't want to just have this really super boring sitting of almost nothing happening so i'm gonna go ahead and block this in but normally i would just leave the drawing lines I uh, wouldn't really have to define them very much yet, but it's mostly because I made the lines. Like I, I know where I'm going with it. There's a little intentionality behind the lines. Without that, you might just think I'm really 
doing nothing productive here. So I'm going to go ahead and jump the gun here. What I'm not going to do is develop small shape detail until I'm really confident that it's working. But in my initial shapes, I really, really like it so far. Like uh, all these little spaces in here work, uh, at least on the simple level. And uh, to this point, I really haven't done anything in the way of fine shape details. Only the only the bigger shapes broken down a little bit on this one. And this is going to be over a series of glazes that. Um, you know, there's going to be some, some, I don't know, stages to build up, mostly because that iridescence is a really tricky thing to pull off. And so um, I really like it so far. If I overdo the value range too much, I'm not worried about that because then on the next sitting, I'll just glaze it. So much, I'd much rather worry about relative values than actual color. And uh, I've been doing that so far throughout the whole journey, just making small adjustments as I go. And uh, the way I treat color is, is that sort of global approach. It's like if it works for the whole painting, but the colors are slightly off. I don't really care as long as the system of light works. So if I if my light source has a direction, color and intensity, and that's consistent throughout the whole painting, nobody would really know if it's off. And um, that's the way I'm treating it. I'm not uh, not worried about being exact. I'm worried about being uh, expressive. I'm worried about making it feel like light is creating volume and anything beyond that is bonus so this painting will get whittled down into fine detail there's a time and a place for it and that's not yet but um you know if you look through my channel you'll see a lot of a la prima you'll see you know three four hour paintings from start to finish and none of those really shy away from detail or uh, precision. Uh, it's just this painting is bonkers with texture between basket weaves and really uh, bumpy shells and iridescence and the eventually lace tablecloth. This table, this painting is not one of those kind of rapid fire paintings. Now I could do a version that's looser, but um, part of the uh, goal behind this painting was to be quite intricate. Hey, Lu Jing. How are you? I was just, uh, I was just rambling about uh, my thoughts behind this start. Mm. So you're working on the baskets? I am. Okay. And so far, it's going about according to plan. Uh, the one concern I had early on was that uh, maybe I I blocked in the. Remember my initial start? I had the basket maybe a little bit bigger than I wanted, and um, it wasn't that I was worried about it. It's just I I set the goal of saying that as I refine this, it's gonna I'm gonna shrink it down. Well, there's a little bit of concern that I did that too much, but the way this early design of the slats, these weaves will look, I'm pretty encouraged that um, it's going to fit. Now, I might come in with problems later, and um, I was explaining that 
The only reason that I'm going into uh, some of these light shapes in here is because of demonstration, just because uh, this is going to be a very slow process. Uh, I can see that my hand is blocking the camera and I just wanted something for people to see where I'm going early on, but that's just a little artificial. I would normally keep this in just drawing lines for a while, uh, just for the sake of uh, that ability to just wipe these patterns off and not leave like opaque haziness. Uh, if it's just a glaze on top of this network of values, all right, it's just the easiest thing in the world to just wipe right off and it had it would have had no impact at all. So, uh, you know, demonstration, I don't know. I wouldn't have to do it that way. Everyone's just invited to watch me paint. It's not necessarily a formal demo, but um, I don't know. That, this is encouraging, at least. Uh, I'll say that. But I'm not going to continue this level of specificity for too long, uh, just for the sake of, I, I just like to, instead of worrying about the value so much, it'd be so nice to just do what I almost always do and just simply focus on uh, one, one pigment, just drawing. I don't have to worry about changing the value as I go. Don't have to worry about any details or anything. I'll just get the pattern in place and then come back in just kind of like what I did here and, um, you know, modify the, the values within these little drawing lines. Ooh. Uh, oh, thank you, uh, Sandra. Hey, Liz, other people are getting in just fine. Uh, nobody's nobody's getting asked for a, a passcode, are they? Um, hello. Hi, Malika. Hey. Hello. I think Liz is having some problem. Yeah, Liz is, but nobody else seems to. No. I don't know why. Uh, maybe maybe she needs to uh, like log out and try again. All right. I'm just putting it in the chat for her. Okay. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Good, Liz. I was just typing, maybe try it again, because several people are in there. You might have tried too early. I don't know. Well, that, there you go. I'm glad I have multiple channels going. <laughs> All right, so right here is very encouraging. So the spacing works so far there's zero detail there's just simply like the tracks and then i've got a little bit of the light happening i don't think the light is actually bright enough but the way i would encourage doing it and the way i'd rather do it is just simply to draw these lines in here it's going to be a little hard to see the line so i'm going to have a second dark i have a dark that's mixed with a little bit of black and ultramarine blue just to push it a little bit darker so that i can see through these shadows but really, the magic in this area is that you can see through the slats and see the shells through it. I just didn't want to do that too early because that requires a lot of, like, you just have to place it just right or else it'll be a hodgepodge. And, and the reason I went solid is because that affords me the ability to just simply draw. This is just like a piece of charcoal. And uh, as long as I can tre keep track of which slat I'm working on, I can just continue it all the way to the base. And then there's some overlap that I would definitely get away with it if, if like one slat just happened to disappear along the way, you know, but I'm going to try my best to make it make sense without feeling like it has to be every little slat because this is, uh, this isn't meant to do that. This is meant to, to be, um, realistic, but not, I'm not ever really a beholden to my subject i'm creating a painting so like cameras do a great job of catch, capturing what's in front of you we can get those printed and, and everything here it's more about creation so if it makes sense that's that checks all the boxes for me and so this is going to be my painting of this basket i owe the basket absolutely nothing
So here's here's the big advantage. So my line got a little bit sloppy there. If I just take a little bit of clean meat, uh, clean oil on a clean brush, I can erase the lines just by shit, like just erasing them, just shifting them over just a tiny, tiny bit. And I get my clean line, my clean drawing line, and I get um, basically right back to where it started from value wise. And so uh, I'm gonna just keep going with these drawing lines. The weave is actually a little tricky if you had this like perfect allegiance to every every slat. But again, a lot of times what I've found with these patterns is, yeah, maybe if it's not exact, it's gonna it's gonna have the right anatomy to it. And uh, we reserve terms like anatomy for things like skeletons and muscles and stuff like that. No, there's a there's an anatomy to this basket too. And you can figure out an anatomy to a lot of things like waves for a for a you know painting an ocean uh, or you know even shells and things like that. They have that sort of anatomy to them. And once I figure that out then um, and I can make it my own. Just like if I wanted to make up a human, I would be referring in my head into um, what I've studied for a very long time. And that's, you know, human anatomy, morphology, the, the uh, muscle, muscle, muscle masses, their origin and termination, all that jazz. But what I found with, with painting in particular, well, not painting in particular, but uh, art in general, is um, that this is experiential learning. So we could academically learn, uh, you know, we could watch a, a YouTube video on how to, how to weave a basket, but that doesn't mean we necessarily have to paint, uh, know how to paint it. And so, um, through experience of, try, of figuring this out on previous paintings, I, I know where I'm going. I have the confidence that this is going to get me to my finished product, even if I don't get it on my first try, but it really looks like I'm going to. And I'm not saying that to be boastful or anything. It's just I've seen this before. I've seen this stage. One bad habit I have is just not being aware of what brush I'm using at a given time. So if my if my eraser brush gets compromised, then I have to switch to a new brush. <laughs> and that happens. But uh, normally on this sitting, I won't have any other brushes that have paint on them. And that wouldn't be a concern. But since I've done a little bit of that modeling work up there, and again, it's only because I'm filming and um, Partly that it's going to be boring and partly because I keep blocking the what I'm working on with my hand. And I'm, I'm aware of that. I just would spend too long trying to make it otherwise. And I'm, that's just a slight compromise in the way I like to do it. So by the time I get into here, I'm just simply drawing lines. And if they, if they give me a system that I feel like works, then then I'll, I'll do all this uh, modeling of um, the light and shadows. And then I'll get that uh, feeling that there's shells underneath these weaves and has light coming through, which I think is going to be really cool. So if by the end of the sitting, I don't have it perfect, that's perfectly fine because I'll have more information than when I started from. So that's just that other little aspect of sometimes you just got to go for it because even if it's a mistake, you'll have more information than when you started from, you'll be able to problem solve. 
So there are some artists, and I, I, I don't, I try not to knock anybody's uh, technique, even if I do it a little differently, um, because I, I really appreciate that a lot of people can get there in a really great way, and I can still do it my way. Um, but some artists would have this completely worked out on like tracing paper and then trace and transfer it where they would have a million points of measurement and that's really good for them. I kind of like that whole figure it out as you go bit. Again, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of the anatomy so I can make it my own and still be somewhat realistic. And um, that's the way I like to do it. And if you look through my portfolio, you'll see examples of lace tablecloths and baskets and they all kinds of things. And I can guarantee you that if you traced a photograph and placed it on my painting, it wouldn't be exactly like the basket weave or the lace tablecloth. It would be my version of it. And it would, I mean, I, I'd like to say that it makes sense. And it has a sense of anatomy to it. It has that story of the light to where uh, a consistent direction, intensity, and color of the light create volume. Well, the illusion of volume. And so one thing that I might want to do is if I can track at least one of these weaves to here and I might have that consistent curve so at that point if I can follow just one of these and then do a vertical plumb line so right about here okay I think I nailed it on that spot if I have just one weave that I can base the curve off of, then my system will work. Again, regardless if it's 100% accurate to this basket, as long as it's believable on that first impression to the viewer who's never seen this basket, never seen this setup, never seen this lighting. Uh, and that's, that's really the concern I have. And if you go back to the old masters, you know, before the age of phones and computers and um, you know projectors and all that stuff, you know, you go back to the age of Rubens. Like, yeah, sure, you could go back to some artists uh, after the lens was in, uh, invented and say maybe some of them use some camera obscura or things like that, but you certainly can't do that for the early Baroque and Renaissance masters of like Rubens and Halls and Rembrandt and Durer and uh, Leonardo and Michelangelo and those guys, they, they produce really, really super incredible paintings through this sort of mastery of anatomy and technique. And, uh, you know, they didn't have the exotic colors and pigments and stuff like that. They had to learn the hard way and they were able to create because of it. So that's, that's the, that's the ethos I have coming in here. I've spent a very long time, uh, kind of honing my craft. I've, I've really thought about the, you know, beyond just the do, but also the why, like, how does this work? How do, how do I make, how do I pull it off? And for better or worse, right? So I, I'll fully admit that, you know, there's some really incredible artists out there that do it a radically different way. And maybe, you know, you'll say this person does it better or that person, whatever. I'm good with that. <laughs> hey, Liz, you figured it out. So it, yeah, was ask, um, it was asking you for a password? Yeah, but it, the, I figured out what the problem was. What there's was um, on the latest message that you sent. Okay. You know, on Instagram, there's a, there's a typo. Oh, shoot. But you still have a lot of people on, so, I mean, that's well, good. Maybe I need to correct that. Yeah, you, if you can. I don't know. Um, I think I can. 
Yeah, I got them because I I had uh, you had the previous ID. Yeah. What was? Yeah, and I just went by your latest message instead of. What was the typo? Uh, instead instead of four seven six six five one four one five two, you had four two five two. Oh shoot! I see it. Yep. Um. Oh, geez, that's in the photo itself. That'd be a big edit. Okay. Well. Yeah, I'll just put it in the text. Four one four one five two. The. So maybe you can put it in the text of the YouTube. On YouTube. On YouTube, Instagram. You know, in the chat, in case somebody's trying to get in. Oh, right, on YouTube, too. Yeah, you're right. That's wrong. Oh, shoot. Anyway, you got a lot of people watching. I do, but I hope I didn't frustrate anybody. Well, I'm not frustrated. I just didn't want you to think I abandoned you. Well, you're a good actress because I don't get the sense that you're seething in anger and rage, but it's there. I'm not seething in anger and rage. <laughs> it's there. Because she has her camera off. Ah, that's right. <laughs> Seething, anger, <laughs> rage. Oh my, what did I do? You you do have a lot of people on now, so that's good. Yeah, I'm very I'm very grateful for everybody watching. I think most people probably have the code from last time, you know. But if I put it on, but you know, it shouldn't matter. Actually, there is a whole uh, typo too in the text, not in the photo. <laughs> now I noticed. Oh, really? Yeah. Wait, there's a photo in the, there's a typo in the text too? Yeah, from last time. Oh, really? I think, yeah, the meeting ID was not correct, but I think you have the link. So I well, I just copied the link and that worked. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I, I'd like to emphasize I'm a better artist than I am a <laughs> promoter. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think so, at least. Yikes. All right. Well, maybe someday I'll have a manager. I don't know. Or, uh, um, what do you call them? Um, agent. Yeah. Agent. Yeah. 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 Or something. So anyway, anyway, so she was thinking about going to this bullshit thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that somebody talking to me? Breaking up. I don't. I don't think so. But I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I don't know either. Has their mic unmuted and probably the background noise. Yeah, that happens. Well, I mean, I don't want to eavesdrop on something I'm not supposed to hear either, you know. Right. If it kept going, I was I was just going to look for where the source was and mute it, but um, no big deal. So this these these sittings are going to be tedious. They're not going to be uh, very entertaining. So I'm sorry about that. And what I don't want to do is rush. If I feel like the pattern isn't working. Because part of the purpose of this sitting is not necessarily that I'm just going to draw it in place and it's going to go perfect. It's it's the, the purpose of every stage to this point is that I can make mistakes, that this the, the, the drawing can be a little off and I can recover. So I might I mean, I, I definitely don't want to rush. That's, that's a one of the things that um, is tempting to do when you're demonstrating especially on something that's so slow and tedious, like the basket, the, uh, the same thing with the lace, the lace is going to be tedious. It's going to be slow. Um, from all the other lace paintings I've done in the past, it's not like I had to correct anything, but I did have to move pretty slow because there's really intricate, tiny shapes. And, um, what I don't want to do is, uh, rush and make silly mistakes. And then nobody really benefits because you, know, you won't get a decent painting to watch and I won't get 
a decent product. <laughs> so, um, and I'd, I'd be, if I'm showcasing my method, that's A, not my method and B, bad to follow. If you're rushing something that's got to be intricate and has somewhat of a system to it. And again, I, you know, there's a lot of artists I respect that would have traced this from photo, like take a photo, you trace it and you superimpose it on here or at least freehand the drawing and superimpose it. You know, I don't have anything bad to say about that other than I really like that my skill set is built upon the hard work it takes to learn how to draw and work things out. And again, I, I like to figure out the sense of anatomy for this basket as opposed to all the other baskets I've done and um, all the other paintings I've done. Like every painting has its unique challenge, but they all have a sense of anatomy to make them work. Like this urchin, these cascading lines that are gonna be there eventually. These, this series of big ridges that happen on this shell. Um, you know, the, the decreasing sizes of these ringlets on this shell. They all have a sense of anatomy that it's it's not like anybody would really know what the anatomy of that shell is, but there's going to be a funniness to it if I get it wrong. So I do bother to I do bother to really figure out a system, but not necessarily copy every little thing. The basket is looking great. Uh, so far, so good. I mean, I might have to. I like what you're doing. Might have to problem solve a little bit. And if I was being, if I was being really careful, like I started to draw this line with a light because that's the, the thickness of the basket weave. Technically, this dark line here would be the same thing. But uh, I explained earlier that the only reason I'm doing those uh, value modifications is simply because I keep blocking the painting with my hand. And it's going to be so slow going that it's not going to be very entertaining. I mean, I guess I could I could sing a song or something for you. <laughs> but this is going to be a lot of little tiny lines. I'm going to make small little adjustments until I feel like the system works. I can't wait to get to these crossing lines, which I could do now. But um, my tendency is... I'm in the flow of doing these lines. So I don't want to really stop my train of thought to do those. And they have a little bit of a perspective system to it. I'm looking more up on these on top of them being curvier in the first place. And um, what, the other thing that's really important to me that it's easy to forget while you're demonstrating is that taking small breaks to see how you're doing is really important. So um it, there's no real replacement for getting away from your artwork now you can do little tricks like put the um the painting in the, the camera setting of your phone or looking at a hand mirror i have a mirror behind me that i can refer to by looking backwards um and those are all good uh like fill-ins but it doesn't replace getting away from your artwork uh, when you get away from your artwork, you you uh, you can reestablish that first impression, and that's really how the viewer of your artwork is going to judge it. They're going to see that first impression, they're going to form an opinion, and whatever they see after that first impression will reinforce their first impression. So if you really, if your first reaction is this visceral dislike of it, no matter how cool the details are, you're going to maintain that opinion. I mean, the more I think about it, you know, the more I've thought about it over the years, I mean, the more it's true for me. Like, it's, I think it's pretty, pretty true for almost anybody. I mean, there, there's going to be rare exceptions where, like, there's a deeper meaning that had to be revealed later, and maybe that changed your mind. But for the most part, when you're looking through a magazine, you're looking at that uh, small version of the whole painting. Uh, most of the time, your first impression holds true, no matter how cool the, the details are or how soft the edges are. Um, the opinion, that first impression of the painting is the one that lingers. And um, the same is true for if your first impression is you really love it, but it's inaccurate, it doesn't matter. You're going you're gonna to 
look at that those neat details and it's going to support that you love the painting or you're going to look at the the what could be considered a mistake if your first impression was bad it could be considered an artistic choice if if uh your first impression is good so like you're not always going to have the artist standing right next to the work explaining why like the vase is crooked or the basket makes no sense. It's just going to be a part of this, you know, something looks funny about that basket. And um, I'm, I'm more concerned about the anatomy of the basket than I am the like weave count. Hans, uh, did you want to record? Ah, uh, yeah, forget about that every time, don't I? I am recording on uh, YouTube. Okay. And so my big conversation on how I screwed up the uh, invitation is all there. Uh-oh. <laughs> recording in progress. <laughs> Recorded for posterity for all time. <laughs> but not on Zoom. Not on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll use that video for the edit. No. <laughs> there's gotta be a redeeming something redeeming about that no it doesn't matter i i free i don't know like i i get criticism for it sometimes that i i tell everybody all my mistakes hey, it's part of the process i mean i you know i've even banned you know you know me with teaching i i even banned the word mistake it's like you know all this is just a buildup of information and yeah, sometimes it doesn't, you know, like you miss a fundamental or two. It's okay. But if it's just a drawing error, that's not a mistake. That's that's just information. Information, All right, exactly. All right, I'm just happy I'm on. Well, me too. Sorry about the typo. That's okay. I should have just remembered the code from before. Well, but other people wouldn't be able to do that. You fixed it in the comments, so probably. Hi, Ellen. Hopefully. Ellen figured it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And Sand and Sandra and Liz was telling me how I messed it up. <laughs> Those are all uh, YouTube comments. I don't know. Like on Zoom, I'm sure there's a w I have to look into uh, the YouTube settings more because I, I like the interactive nature of these. Like for the most part, I started setting up not as demonstrations, but just, hey, come and hang out with me as I paint and you can paint too with, some, with your own subject. And I don't know, just kind of a little, a little art party. It's kind of morphed into more of like, uh, this is a demo type thing, but I don't know. It doesn't have to be. I'm going to paint. I'm going to, I'm trying to make a better effort to get back into the paint world, like the art world anyway. And so this is just kind of, forces me to set up and um, happy to have the company at the same time. So right now where it's where that line is getting thick, those darks, I in my mind's eye, I'm keeping track of those as the negative spaces that are eventually going to be light, but I just don't want to change the value on my brush right now. Because those slats are super neat looking, but I don't want to opaque paint there. I want to be able to just say, look, I don't like this pattern and it's gone. Right. I love that. So um, I'd really rather just use the raw or burn umber right now as a uh, almost like a stick of charcoal. And so where my lines are getting thick, I'm just keeping in my mind's eye that I'm eventually going to get those big thick opaque lights of seeing through the basket weave and into the shells behind it which is one of the coolest things about this shell and the set art not shell the basket and the setup is for one you can see uh the shells through the weave and then for two it projects a, a, a lattice of light hitting this far shell which is really cool and then the iridescence and the busy uh lace texture that will get there eventually and uh I don't know. It, it's going to be a, a busy, busy painting, but hopefully in all the right ways. So are you squinting to decide which lines you'll keep taking, which you'll keep taking for the basket weave? No. 
So the squinting was the squinting was more of eliminating. Yeah, the squinting is more about eliminating busyness. Um, and uh, right now it's it's just like an abstract drawing. Like it's it's a shape. It connects to a certain point. And there's a lot of overlap here. So it's it's actually really hard to see that, you know, one stripe goes all the way down. But that is perspective. So like the weaves that I'm looking straight at are basically vertical lines. And the weaves that are going this way really curve. And then these weaves are going this way. And that's all perspective. That's my eye level. My eye level on, on the basket is like right here. And so... I'm trying to keep track of all this stuff, but I'm going to be really, um, I'm going to keep all the self-loathing and, and cuss words to myself and pretend this is going super, super smoothly for all of you. And <laughs> no, so far, so good. No cuss words yet. No. Uh... It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> but I'm actually surprised it's going so well. Like, you know, this usually takes a little bit of design work before you even realize whether it's working or not. And um, I don't know, I think it's going pretty good. So we'll just keep our eye out for that. But again, I, I have to apologize that this, this is going to be pretty slow. This, this has to be somewhat designed from, from my satisfaction and to make sense. And um, I want to keep my eye open. I don't want to just randomly throw lines down and then discover later that I just don't like it. And so I'm going a little slow. Uh, I'm going to base a lot of decisions on this curve, even if, you know, my perspective isn't exactly right. Again, it just has to make sense. And um, I'm going to follow a, a few little star uh, weaves that I feel like are the stars of the show, like the ones that I really want to use. And the rest are just going to be supporting characters that I hope uh, just kind of help uh, fill in the gaps. Uh, so if you looked at the work of the 18th century, no, yeah, 18th century master, he, he lived in the time of Bugro. Um, Adolf Menzel, there's a lot of other examples, but Adolf Menzel I like to highlight as an example of somebody that would create hunt, the uh, illusion of hundreds of figures. But only a few of them were defined. Everything else was just kind of blobs that they become people because of the well-defined ones and the mass. And so uh, that's what I'm going to do with this basket weave. There's going to be a few well-designed slats. And the rest become accurate because of those few designed slats. So, so stepping back and giving it that first impression is really important for that reason. Um, and then like if, if I have a few slats that really, uh, you know, they're the wrong scale or something like that, I should be able to see that pretty fast. But again, uh, part of what makes this weave really, really cool are those pockets of light of shells going through the openings of the slats. And right now I've kind of just got to envision them as these thick darks right now. And uh, that's for the purpose of not putting opaques there, which if I wiped out would make it a blurry mess. But also, too, is I don't have to think of anything more than design when I just have a dark and a single brush. I don't have to change the values. I don't have to change the color. Um, I just have to draw. And if I make it a, a shape that I don't like, then I wipe it right off and... I'm right back to where I started and I don't have to worry about a thing. So that that's the system. And right now it's not going to look like much except for right here that I developed a little prematurely. Just, uh, you know, I explained that just because, uh, you know, we're doing a demonstration. My hand is blocking what I'm doing and I want you to just be able to anchor what I'm doing down in something that's visual rather than just me yammering. Because my business card says Hans Garen Art Yammerer. Does it really? No. I'm just kidding. 
I do go off on tangents. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, getting way more attention if you really put that on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've just talked a half an hour on a single brush stroke. <laughs> Can't help it. But I do like that, you know, I'm I'm not describing one brushstroke. I'm describing a way of thinking that goes from painting to painting. It's not you're not ever just painting one painting. You're you're creating a a system that you can apply to the next one and the next one and the next one. So if you understand your color theory, you're applying it to the next painting. If you understand this sense of anatomy you're applying that to the next painting if you understand composition or experiment with different things and now you've expanded your toolbox to to go into the next painting so like i i don't know that and that's why that's why i go off on those big tangents is that i think it's really cool so i you know i share that enthusiasm while i'm teaching no, it's good because sometimes I also get stuck in one area of the painting, whereas I know that there are other areas which demand equal attention, but sometimes it just happens that I'll just keep on going in circles on one part because I, I'm struggling with it. And so it's it's just good to know that uh, it's uh, normal and other people go through that too. And Well, I mean, uh, when I'm teaching you, it's because I've made all those mistakes before. <laughs> So that, that's why it's you know pretty easy to recognize them. It's like, hey, I've done that before, and I knew what I was. I knew the. I figured out the reason why I was making that mistake, and then I can, I can share that with you, right? Yeah, it it does save a lot of time when when someone can just help me out with that. But that's not really how my grandmother taught. My grandmother was like a, put a light there, put a dark there type. Uh, teacher and she was super good at it and she would she'd pick up your brush she'd do it and then you'd understand it I explained it a lot more than she ever did but that's not a good thing or a bad thing it's just a different style and I, I would never say that her teaching was bad it was incredible um, but I, I just have a different way I, I have a more analytic approach um, I would say Andy is more like how my grandmother taught except he's a little nicer about it she wasn't mean but she was very to the point like she would just like there was no mincing of the words she didn't feel like she had to butter you up before giving you the critique <laughs> so, so it was like more direct it was super direct <laughs> okay yeah almost like you know you had to you had to really go through like the transcript in your head to see like did she just rip me apart? Well, no, not really. She didn't say anything like that, but it felt, <laughs> it, it could feel kind of painful sometimes. <laughs> and so, uh, so step one was just abstract design. Step two was big masses of light and dark. Even though I see all these little holes through the basket weave, even though I see these transversing lines of uh, weave, it was just squinting down and getting this, okay, light here, shadow there, reflected light there. Um, and now I'm just going back to abstract design. And uh, then I'll get into getting that, getting the, the weave, transitioning rather than this that kind of flatness i'll get those transverse lines in there i'll get the shells coming through uh and all that's in my mind's eye as i'm trying to figure this out but i can imagine it'd be really boring to watch so i was in a heated debate with liz over whether i should go live for weaving all these little tiny nitpicky brush strokes for the for the lace tablecloth, which I think would be extraordinarily boring. <laughs> I, I think maybe for you, but not for us. <laughs> not, not for me, at least. Yeah, I agree with you, Malika. <laughs> <laughs> heated <laughs> debate. It was not heated. <laughs> <laughs> you said you had a heated debate with Liz, which I was like, huh. 
Clearly. You're, you're like, I know this. He's not telling the truth here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean in my head it's already extraordinarily boring i can tell you how all the lace paintings i've done before i've probably done about six of them uh i get bored even just doing it like i've told you uh I, that i've i've been present for will wilson painting um both the early stages of his paintings and the later stages of his paintings. The beginning is super exciting. He's splashing around color and values in this awesome drawing. Um, and then he blends it down and, and then waits for it to dry and then sands it and then does it again. Those first like three or four sittings, they're awesome. They're exciting to watch. The last few, he's doing this for like eight hours straight. Like one, like two or three, like single, the like number one sables at a time. And it's boring. He almost always, always had uh, like a TV show on or a movie. Yeah, not compelling TV right there. <laughs> so why was he standing down the initial stages? Um, like, was he standing down the mistakes? No, uh, he's just sanding down the textures. So the blending gets some of the textures gone, but it's a very light blending because uh, really you're just knocking down the textures, not dragging one thing into the next. So he's keeping it super smooth as he builds up. Okay. And um, like I said, those early sittings are really exciting. But the latter sittings, not so much. And so like, this is just kind of tedious work. I can't imagine it's compelling. <laughs> so the, the debate rages on. I gotta make up my mind. So when- <laughs> The debate uh, <laughs> that we have no problem watching you paint a leaf. Yeah, so Liz was screaming at me and throwing things and saying, no, you've got to go live for that. I'm like, oh, it's so boring. I'm so sad I missed that. Yeah, yeah. I, I missed it too. There, <laughs> there was chaos and turmoil in the uh, in the Schuler studio. <laughs> I after you left, Malika, so you, you didn't see it. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely going to record it. See how you do this because then when we have to do it, then we'll have an idea. Yeah, but I mean, all all the city, like I'm going to record every brushstroke unless I make a mistake in uh, you know like hitting record or something. But um, just whether or not it goes live, because like I said, oh, I the okay. the initial blocking of the lace. I'm just going to solidify. I'm going to get take a T square to the table. I'm going to do another glaze down here. I'm going to let that thoroughly dry. And then I'm going to take just old paint uh, translucently. And I'm just simply going to design the more integrated shapes and leave the big pockets. And then it's just going to be flick, flick, <laughs> more back to the palette, flick, 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 <laughs> back to the palette. I mean, it's just slow and tedious. It's, it's just... I don't know. It's obnoxious, really. Um, and then, you know, it's like I spend days doing these little flicks of paint. I say, whew, glad it's over. I'm never doing that again. And then I do another painting with lace. Yep. <laughs> it's almost a, a running gag and a tragedy, but somehow I keep upping the uh, complexity. So that first lace uh, tablecloth, uh, it was the same thing. It was the, I, that was that heirloom, uh, heirloom tomatoes painting. And I, it was slow and tedious. And then I just said, I'm doing that again. And then not only did I do it again, but I tripled the volume, the, area of 
lace. And then I did it as a live contest. And then I did it as an alla prima. That's a crazy one, the alla prima one. All of them are crazy. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Glutton for punishment, I guess. All right, so my, my uh, pattern is starting to break down just a little. I expected this. Um, and again, part of it is this that I've got to imagine that these darks are actually lights if I want to do it this way. I might just put those lights in just because the darks aren't really doing like that strategy is sound, but it's not working. Like it was not, it was a good idea that. Not all good ideas are sound. I don't know. I guess that's a contradiction. A contradiction. In other words, like you know, reasoning your way through it. I don't know. You don't always get to uh, the right idea. You said Nuxing is working on a basket too, right? Ask her. She's watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm okay on that. Uh, haven't made much progress. <laughs> wow. Didn't you do one before, I thought? Uh, yeah, I did one before. Yeah, I thought I remember that. Yeah. Did I show you? I think I came in one day and, and, oh, you, oh, no, and I was like, oh my gosh, look at that. I was very impressed. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I thought that turned out great. Okay, uh, a basket with a different type of anatomy. I hope that will work out. Well, that's the thing. That's uh, they. It's not like one basket weave means that you know how to paint basket weaves. They're they're all a little different. No. Nope. But you can figure out just that there's a substructure to it. Like all these weaves have to connect to something. If you figure that out, at least your system can make sense, even if you get you know, things a little wrong. Um, all this down here is all overlapping and a little weird. So that's why I've fallen short a little bit here. There's just a few that are gonna connect and they're gonna overlap some of the other weaves. So I don't feel like I have to get this as right as I do here where I wanted to see those shells through. And then it's back to overlap up here. So this was, this went really, really well here. I'm starting to doubt a little bit whether I have enough space for those weaves without the weave, um, like these slats getting too skinny. And so that's that's what I'm hesitating on right now. But I knew there was going to be some problems to solve. I, I didn't have the uh, delusion that it's all just going to be like, I'm just going to throw down lines and it's going to be perfect. Um, I didn't spend that much measurement to start with for that to happen or like tracing. Or anything so you just have to expect it there's the downside of the technique of uh just trying shapes uh that you estimate and then build the specificity into that there's always going to be a problem solve element to it and that's already baked in the cake it's that there's there's no mystery about it none of those shapes that i put down in the start with were meant to be perfect because i didn't take the time to make them perfect but the downside is, is you have to you have to figure out this problem solving on the painting itself. Now that's why that's exactly why I didn't want to put that bright opaque paint coming through the weaves, even though I'd see it a little bit better. I want to be able to just wipe it back, wipe off wipe off the drawing lines if I need to. Like if it's just not working. I can go right back to the original painting without smearing opaque paint everywhere. So I think it's working, but there's that little note of caution of saying, okay, I need to make sure that I have enough space for those, uh, those slats that leave pockets of the shells coming through because that's right. really, really important to me. If it wasn't important to me, then, you know, I, I'm sure I could pull it off as a believable weave. But having that, having those little pockets are really important to me. They're part of so what makes this painting super that, cool. Um, for those, you'll probably wait till like after you have your pattern in to put that light in. Yeah, I want to make sure that the system works. 
And Got then it. I'm just going to lightly dab those darks and then I'm going to lay those in as uh, opaques. Now, in layering like that, because I'm trying to put a light over a dark, um, I'll have to go thicker than that previous layer or else it's going to mix. And I better relegate my brush strokes to one or two because three or four means that the brush has transferred its pigment onto the surface. Now there's less paint on the brush and more on the surface, and that's just going to make it mix with the previous layer. But if I can just lay down a single brush stroke and leave it, it's, gonna mix. it's yeah. gonna sit on top. It's not gonna mix. Right. And that it requires feel. Feel is really super hard to, uh, to teach. Like I can tell you whether it's working or not working, but to teach it, that's a feel. That's really, uh, that's going to be experiential learning. Are you going to wait uh, until uh, the next setting to put the light in? Well, uh, that's in my, that's in, that's, that's the decision I'm going to make later. Because um, if this goes swimmingly from, from here to there, I might just go ahead and put it in. If it okay. doesn't, then I'll spend more time problem solving. Yeah. Um, and uh, I say this to you all all the time. It's like, if we don't necessarily beat ourselves up that it's a mistake, then we just realize that putting some information down helps us with making it right. Like we can adjust this. But if I just said, oh, it's not working and just wiped it off, I'd be just as likely to make a second mistake or the, the same mistake or a slightly different mistake. But if I can build off of this to make it what I want, I, I'll be doing that from a place of information, from a place of uh, knowledge and experience. So, you know, this is a this is a win-win, even if there's that moment of frustration that, you know, there's something just not working. But I think it is working. Um, and that's another point, too, is sometimes, sometimes it can be going better than you think. And um, you just have to work through it a little bit. And so these, these openings might need a little bit of work because what I don't want to do is have them this thick up here and then get really thin just to let that air go through it. But um, when I get into here where the, the slats are more spaced out because of perspective, uh, I, I really think, I mean, I like it a lot better than I thought I liked it. And so, um, several things like, uh, that onion and, um, silver tea kettle painting, Liz, you were with me. No, it wasn't that one. It was the eggshell painting, the eggshell painting. I really wasn't feeling from the beginning. I thought it was going really poorly and, uh, it turned out fine at the end. I just had a bad mindset and that happens even with all this experience, it's like, you know, sometimes you just have to work through it. And if I would have just abandoning it, I would have, I would have been giving up on a painting that was working better than I thought. And so when I was in here working, I don't know, I just looked at these spaces and say, I'm missing out on this really cool thing of these spaces in between the weaves. I didn't think it was working, but now that I'm into here, I think it is. And so, um, yeah. Don't listen to your own lying brain. <laughs> That's good advice. <laughs> and so I'm continuing all these lines down, but I know a lot of that has to be altered, right? There's a lot of overlap with the weaves here. So that's why I just let it trail off. Um, I just want to feel like it's connecting to this base theoretically, and then I'll worry about how it overlaps. And again, if, if my overlap isn't the same, but it looks like it works, then I'm good. Um, I'm going to proceed, but it, if it feels like it's not working, then I'm going to problem solve. That's our favorite thing. That's my, yeah. I mean, that's, I love the problem solve. I, I think it's, I mean, that's really the crux of our teaching. 
you're problem solving by introducing the fundamentals into each piece in its uniqueness. Like every painting is going to have its own uh, relevance to the fundamentals. And yeah, um, I need to work on that. But, but, yeah. but the fundamentals are applied in such a wildly different way, like color theory depends on the color of the light. Well, unless your setup is exactly the same every time, then you're problem solving for the, the color of the light being slightly different sometimes, or the angle or the intensity. And so, I mean, that's, that's really got to do just as much with saying, well, this is the color complement to this color. It's like, well, what's the color of the light doing to basket weave? Well, it's doing this in the highlight areas. It's doing this in the middle tone. It's doing this in turning shadow. It's doing this in reflected light. Reflected light has a lot to do with the tablecloth and the shell, right? So, yeah, it's the same kind of things, but uh, I might have a high sheen thing or a high iridescence on here. I don't have as much iridescence on these two. And the the, sh the weave of the basket is maybe a little shinier than, say, like the urchin or that shell back there, or even this one here. Um, and uh, they're, they're going to receive the same light slightly different. So we're going to evaluate each painting. It's going to have the same fundamentals applied in a slightly different way. And the more times you do that, the the better over, uh, overall understanding you have for problem solving for the next painting and the next painting and the next painting. And so um, I love that adaptability and I love that feeling that I don't have to have everything perfect right off the bat, that I can fix problems as I go, that I can understand how to make it work on the fundamentals, even if I don't have it exactly like the subject, like uh, portrait, yeah, if it's a portrait commission, you better have the likeness. Um, but you can do a lot of things to make the likeness better when you understand anatomy or if you understand light or if you understand um, how to, you know, flatter the model or, you know. So that was my grandmother was an absolute master at removing wrinkles and harshness and double chins and uh, you know, making skin tones, uh, you know, warm and expressions inviting. When you have a model posing, we've all seen that like zombie death stare at the end of 20 minutes. Well, her portraits had life. Like they were attentive and, and, you know, like they were having a conversation with you. So like, that's, that's a real skill. It's something that's not necessarily capturing what you see, but capturing a lot of potential based off of all that knowledge and all that experience. All right, so now the weave is really tight in here as the weave is overlapping itself, rounding around that corner. It's really opening up in here, and then it's tightening back up again as it starts to overlap this way. So again, I, that was perspective. Uh, and I feel like these are angling in just a little bit much. So I'm going to straighten these lines out a tiny bit. But my system, again, wasn't perfect off the bat, but it was better than I thought. As you're facing that basket uh, head on, uh -huh. Those um, verticals, they're, they're like straight up and down, right? Almost. Okay. I don't think I have any that are, well, maybe one one or I two mean, that are particularly vertical. Look at it, right? I mean, from a perspective point of view. Yeah, well, and that makes sense too, because as you turn, this weave is going to be over top of that weave. And this one's going to be over top of that one and that one and that one. So there, it's going to close down a lot. And then uh, because this is arcing at me and coming up, it just looks like a straight line. But this is going to arc away from me and then come up. Okay. And so, uh, again, I need a system that's believable. I don't have to get it exactly right, but um, 
it's not like I'm painting haphazardly either. I'm right. trying to capture what I see, but I'm, I'm problem solving with uh, being able to recognize when it's off and, um, you know, observing too. I'm not, I'm not shutting off my observation just because I theoretically know the, you know, turning of a basket. Uh, and that's a, that's a big trap we get into with portrait. We think we know what an eye looks like. We think we know what a nose looks like. And that's why when the, the model's head is like tilted backwards, everyone draws the same nose that they think they know and it's totally off. <laughs> or that three quarters turn where the, the nose is not dead center of the face. And if you draw the, the nose the normal way, it makes no sense. Um, but again, it's because we shut off our, our observation. So painting truly abstract shapes is really difficult. Like what's that abstract pattern that makes this eye the eye? Um, that's really difficult. But trying to, to make a likeness happen when you have a generic eye in your head, well, that's, that's tough too. Um, so it's a combination of both. Like I, I'd rather start with the abstract pattern if I'm painting from observation and then um, I already have the likeness and then I whittle those abstract shapes down into smaller shapes. But when I step back from my work, I can problem solve based off all that built up anatomy that's in my head, perspective, uh, color theory, all this stuff. I can say, okay, this is wrong. I know it's wrong because I know this kind of theory of light and depth and volume and sheen and uh you know warm and cool lights and all this stuff so i think it's really i think we want to the way i teach is I, I really like to start with the abstract because that's accessible to everybody like you can't just read anatomy in a book and then paint a figure but you can start without anatomy training painting the abstract while you're learning the intricacies of anatomy, but not just the knowledge of anatomy, but also that experiential learning of doing it and applying it. Um, all right, so now I just can see, can, uh, completed a series of slats. There's a few that I don't like, like right in here, I don't like that. And by saying I don't like it is not good or bad. It, it's an invitation for me to figure out what I don't like about it and how to problem solve. So I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm going to say, okay, I have some information now and how do I make this information work? And again, if, if that means that I'm painting it slightly different than the way I see it, but it works, I'm good with that. It was fun working with Steven's painting. That real abstract one, the sort of swirly patterns and stuff. The green one. Well, now it has green and purple. He really doesn't like the purple. I do, so I'm I'm not buttering him up when I say, oh, I think that's really great. Um, but I could tell he wasn't feeling it. But again, uh, it was just my opinion. Do you think that Ilyana's uh, color palette is growing on Steven though? uh well i mean i like those exotic colors yeah i mean i i really enjoy those colors and when i see eliana doing it it's just like you know okay I, it's again just applying it into not necessarily the literal colors there but a system is the light influencing it from this obviously different color to this obviously different color in a system that works so, I mean, I, I really enjoy working through that with her. As long as we can feel that the light is influencing it in a consistent way, then we've communicated volume. And it just doesn't matter that your figure or portrait is, you know, green skin tone with purple uh, reflect or shadows, right? Uh, because, you know, light consistently affected volume. So, just like any old master painting, when you 
put <clears throat> um, put it in Photoshop and remove the color, you can still tell what it is. It wasn't depending on the color to be three dimensional volume or accurate. Uh, but if your if your system of light goes from like warm color to warm color, it doesn't say that the color of the light influenced the three dimensional form. And so that's that's the exception. So like if we if we had a uh, that that simple system of light affecting color, and they're not the literal color. So what? And when people ask me, well, what what's your formula for skin tone? I say, well, there is none. Because you know, what's my skin tone? Well, I might say, uh, yellow ochre with some uh, cadmium red light and some uh, uh, you know burnt sienna and uh, some white, right? But if you light me with a blue lamp, that's obviously not my skin cut tone. <laughs> It'll be uh, informed by that blue. But the shadow will not be informed by the blue. So my skin tone is going to be probably blue and a rich reddish shadow because it's not being lit by the blue light in the shadow, only uh, you know through reflected light. So. I don't know. You can make almost any color scheme work as long as you can say that the light is doing here in the light and it's not doing that in the shadow. So that story of the light can be believable, even if it's not literal. Okay. Uh, quick question. Okay. Um, it looks to me from what I'm, cause I'm looking at your uh, work on a projector. Uh -huh. And it looks like I can almost see through those slats. Well, uh, these slats are going to be light. They're not going to be dark. Again, I, I didn't. Can, I mean, I feel like I can, um, I can see the light through them already. <laughs> you have done it. Well, uh, you'll see. I'm going to get, um, I'm going to get I the, uh, yeah, no, it, I, I, did, I just can't wait to see that that brightness coming through. I just want to make sure the spacing works. Like right here, I feel like there's a conflict. But again, I haven't really articulated the overlap yet. So there's just a few, few weaves that like this one right here. You can see a lot of the urchin through it. And it connects. And it's being overlapped by this one here and this one here. And so now I've completed one overlap based on just targeting one weave. And I don't have to pull them all off. Like let's say that I keep connecting dots and it just, it's, it can't literally do what it's doing there. It, I'm almost gonna guarantee that it'll work uh, to that third person objective viewer. So like if you, if I put up the image of the um, basket and you could just compare them side by side. You say, oh, he got it completely wrong. Look at how this one does this and that one that. But let's just pretend that, well, you don't have to pretend because I don't have the image up. You, because you can't see it and compare, it will probably just make sense. And that's enough. <laughs> I, I really like it. And so I just, I, when you were saying that, like, I appreciate it, but I just can't wait to see that light coming through the basket. Right now they're darks, but I only wanted to do that because I didn't want to change value and uh, color with every little brushstroke. I just wanted to map it out to where, like, if I came across a problem, I could just trim the line, and not smear, smear paint everywhere. And it was a very, very intentional order of, of, creating these simple masses that I could wipe back to. And that's just a little bit of strategy, but um, there's many other ways. But yeah, I'm with you. I like I like how it's going. So um, last question. No, it like doesn't maybe, have to be last. Like maybe for like um, the next time, if you had like a flashlight where you could kind of shine to where you work that area, 
I think that would be kind of cool to see. A flashlight where yeah, I can like shine? A, like a, like a close-up kind of, but it would be just a shine, shining a light on it to see, to see it a little bit clearer for me. What, uh, see the painting better? Yeah, I mean, I see it well, but I mean, that's a, that's a really cool detail that I want to look at. How about that? I paint in really low light. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Yeah, it's great. I have some printer paper over there. It's like blinding light in the camera right now. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's <laughs> No, I had the I had my dimmer switch down pretty low. I've explained why I do that. I'll explain it for everybody else. Um I was planning a painting one day and I thought I was doing this great demo. I didn't know anything back then, but uh, I was teaching. And um, the, the painting looked great while I was painting it and the students loved it and everything. And I was just on fire. I was strutting out and my chest was puffed out and I was like, hey, look at my painting. Well, in the lighting inside, it looked like a mud pile. It was dreadful. And it was because the painting depended on that bright light in order to be vibrant. And all my color mixing was depending on that bright light. So the sunlight was just so intense that it required the sunlight um, to read the way that I was seeing it. And um, I learned my lesson. So. I started painting in lower light. Oh, there was another part of that story too, is uh, my grandmother lost pretty much all of her vision uh, near the end of her life. And she was doing this pastel painting from the figure model and um, her colors were bonkers. And it was because she couldn't see them, but I loved it. Uh, it was like magenta shadows and lime green reflected lights and really like pure yellow skin tone in the light and i loved it and i knew she was very sensitive to the idea that she couldn't see color so she would have wiped it right out and so i was going to rescue it from her uh, and not let her wipe it out so when i walked across the dark alley i could see what she was seeing the skin tones looked perfect and so i started not only with that landscape painting but also her painting her example I started uh, painting in lower light and not only did I, was I pleasantly surprised with some of my color mixes, kind of like my grandmother's painting that the, the, some of the colors were unexpected, but they worked. But also too, is like people don't always have a bright shining gallery light in their homes. Yeah. So can I make my painting work in low light where most people have their paintings displayed over their couch? and still have the painting look good. So I like painting in pretty low light uh, for that reason. And I've just gotten accustomed to it. Uh, it doesn't bother me. It, but, you know, a lot of students like more light than I do. And that's, it's not neither right nor wrong. It's just I, I like to explain why I do the things that I do. All right, so now I'm going to figure out this overlap, and then I'll really worry about values and edges. Um, what were you going to say, Liz? I was just going to say that for me, it's just that I can't see as well in the low light. That's, that's a concern. Yeah, you got to see what you're doing. But when I when I flip the uh, dimmer brighter, can you see better what I'm looking at? Oh, yeah. Okay. Definitely. Is that bothering you, though? Not really, because I'm not really talking about... Um, I'm not really doing my value range quite yet. Okay. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mute myself. Why? Well, um, because I think, um, I don't have anything else to say right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I I invite everybody to speak. You know. Nobody wants to hear me ramble on for three hours. We don't mind you give up a lot of good information. Oh, did I give away all the secrets? Now nobody has to study with me? 
<laughs> yeah, so th this is rather boring. Um, so real, real grateful you're all doing me. Otherwise, I'd have, I don't know, audio book going or something. This, this is it's just design work. And design work simultaneously means, you know, like basket weave anatomy. So again, I, I don't have to be an expert on basket weave, but I just, I do want to figure out that there's a system to it, not only perspective, but also like, you know, how, how do these wick, how are they connected to the base? How are they, con how do they overlap? Um, and then how do they catch light, which I kind of already have, it's going to take some problems off. Uh, it's not, it's, it wasn't meant to be perfect. Are you going to go over the shelves uh, after the week or are you done with the shelves? Are you finished? No, I uh, I mean, it's just, I'd rather just keep blasting away on this, which seems kind of contradictory to some other things that I've said. Like, uh, I like to bounce around a lot, but I've kind of already taken a guess at most things. Like, I don't have the highlights in here or those little tracks. I don't have the last of light going over this one. But they're already pretty well balanced. Uh, again, I don't want to do the, the weave until I can take a T-square to the table because I want that to read through all the little openings of the weave. I don't really have to do much with the bottom here. I think I probably even want to go a little bit darker for my background there, but not down here. So I'm, I'm developing a, a little bit of insight of where I want to go now that I can see more. Um, I don't really ever like to think that just because I have an idea that I'm going to stick with it tooth and nail to the very end. I like the painting to have a little bit of a voice. And um, then it's just a matter of magnitude. So I could I could come in and say dark background and make it black. But I don't, I don't really like that. I like my darkest darks to be in the subject and my lightest lights to be in the subject. So I don't I generally stay away from the all black background and okay. other artists do it and it looks great uh, definitely not a criticism of anybody else um it's just i have my own personal preferences right and um i'd rather have the background be in the middle value range for the sake of you know light against dark but dark compared to light and it just makes this feel more prominent to me um Again, I, I like to explain all the reasons behind what I do, but I might even violate that for the next painting because the next painting might have a different situation. Like maybe maybe the midtones would struggle to read against the background and I would want to push it super dark. Well, great, you know. Uh, then the darkest dark could be in the background and I would just make that modification to how I usually do it. Because it again, it, it's all about creating the painting uh, and letting it have somewhat of a voice. And by the end product, hopefully the painting and I agree on the creative direction that I want to go. <laughs> I don't know about this Hans Gehring guy. He's schizophrenic. He talks to his paintings. And, and refers to himself in the third person. <laughs> Which is really weird. <laughs> uh, all right. So remember, I, I only put some of those vertical lines going down as placeholders, but they didn't really represent the uh, the overlaps. And so I'm starting to get a, get a system here. And a lot of times less is more. So like where a lot of these weaves overlap here, I really can't see anything. So part of the part of the idea here is just to get rid of it. 
and keep it fairly minimal because that's actually what I see. Um, you know, over explaining things isn't necessarily a good thing. Well, that would be implicit in the word over, but. So Hans, a quick question about um, the one section that you said you were going to do some problem solving. How would you start the problem solving by blending and then going over it again? No, I don't like to erase first. I like to draw and correct over what I feel isn't working first. Okay. Uh, so I'll do the correction and then erase. And that way I can refer to that information that wasn't working to help find what will work okay. um, with rare exceptions. So sometimes, sometimes it's just too busy and you have to eliminate the old information. Um, but if I can keep it there, then I can use it as a reference for how much to change it by. I can do that quick comparison to what was to what is now. And um, I get better results that way. And like I said, I, I used to have, I can tell you as a student, I used to have this sort of need to uh, eliminate the mistake and then people wouldn't be able to walk by my work and judge it, but I don't care about that anymore. So I understand the, the desire to eliminate the mistakes. You don't want to look at it. You don't want anyone to see it. But when you only consider this stuff is not necessarily right or wrong or good or bad or artistic or, you know, pretty or ugly or whatever, and just think about it as information that you can use to make the next right decision, then you don't really worry about that stuff. Um, and that's just a mindset that I think helps to develop over time. It's not like waving a magic wand and all of a sudden that's, that's your new way of thinking about your work. Um, I think what helps with that is that you, uh, eventually your problem solves, get you to the finished product enough that you trust them. And, uh, I don't think you just will that to happen. I think you, you learn it experientially. And I, I found that that's, you know, I've watched a ton of demos, especially, you know, as I was building my skills and everything. And you just think, you know, these, these big name guru artists and stuff, they're just not making mistakes. And I know that to be patently false. They've just been through that mistake so many times that they don't have to react to it and they know how to problem solve through it. I mean, I, I don't know of any artist that uh, just goes from start to finish in a, in a a la prima demo, especially, and not feel like they have to change something to make it work. Uh, but again, they don't have to react to it because they've, they've been through that rodeo. They've been through that problem solve. They have the, uh, the fundamentals down enough that it's got to be one of those fundamentals to fix the problem. They've gone through a lot of creative um, decisions that they they know what they can push and and know how to subdue. If something's competing with like the area that they want to really pop, and so um, like I said, watching Henry Andral, I think he's phenomenal. But he wiped out a lot of drawings. They just weren't working for him. Uh, I've seen Fritz and all his mastery put a big red X through his landscapes. I saw Jacob uh, Collins sweating a bad start. And he pulled it out by the end. You know, really great artist. I think there is a little bit of a pressure to, to get it right when there's a bunch of people watching you, but you know, you pulled it out. So, uh, Laurie, Schwartz, do you know Laurie Schwartz, Liz? Um, I think I do, but I'm not sure. Okay. I've heard the name for sure. Well, she was in uh, Florida once at a David LaFell workshop where he, <laughs> he wiped out the whole demo and, you know, again, it, that stuff happened. Like lions and stuff? What's that? 
is she the one that paints um like wildlife? Mm, not I mean she's painted all kinds of stuff like um I don't know about wildlife per se. She did a few scratch boards with wildlife, but like I've I known a lot of her still yeah. life and I've known some figures that she did. I think she comes to Tuesday nights. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's Andy's okay. class. So I, I don't really know what she's been doing lately, except for in the frame shop. So whatever she's gotten to the frame shop, that's, um, that's what I've seen. She recently completed a hen, and now she's working on a beautiful lion. Okay, cool. Yeah. But yeah, I know who she is. Yeah, she saw a demo uh, with David LaFell that he wiped out the demo. Oh, really? Yikes. So. They, these, these people don't have superhuman talent that, I mean, they might, but still it's it's not ever a given that you know everything's going to go smoothly from start to finish but you don't really have to react to it all that much if if you've been through all the problem solving you have a really solid grasp of the fundamentals for recognizing when something's going awry and how to fix it particularly when you do it my way my way there's no expectation of accuracy it's just big guesses that are going to get me closer than when I started. And then I build the uh, abstract shapes I see when I squint, typically, unless I'm making stuff up. And then I break it down into those five aspects of light according to the light source, and then refine it from there. And normally, all the decision making is already done by the time I'm in detail. So that, that system really works for me. Remember I said I didn't really want to do too much with the urchin until I figured out that edge. Well, I didn't want to figure that out that edge until I got all this stuff in. And I'll still have to glaze the shadow in, but I'll just, you know, envision that. So, um, I think the weave is working. The, um, overlaps are starting to work. Not all of them, but they're, they're getting there. The thing is, is like a lot of them just disappear uh, in the shadows and only only a little bit of information remains. So I, I think it's better to eliminate some of this busyness than to over articulate it. Um, and that I can see that in figuring out these curves, there's the need to trim this bottom edge to um, thin it down and make it roll in more. I'm just going to go ahead and do that. Not with my eraser brush, though. And so, um, I don't know. I'm getting closer and closer. I might just very well dab that a little bit and then get the shells coming through. And that'll be another round of problem solving with the drawing of the weave. Uh, but I don't have to feel like I have to finish it on this sitting. Pretty close. That's the progression I'm going to go in. And then let's say that goes well, and I just want to leave it in the rough end. Uh, then, yeah, I might, I might go into these shells because they're a little further behind the rest. And then um, I might glaze this little pattern on top. It's not much of a pattern. Like, um, it just has a little bit of variety. Uh, 
rolling from that central point to a theoretical point right about there. I like that brightness. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make the bright I'm gonna make the background a little bit brighter to a little bit darker. It's gonna have a bigger exchange of values. Or maybe I could even leave it here and just go really dark here and then transition. The darker I go here, the more prominent this is. And I don't want that to be overly prominent. I'm going to make this. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's just me brainstorming a little bit. And again, it's not something that I would have necessarily had completely worked out, but even if I did, it's a magnitude thing and you can't really tell the magnitude until you get more information. Unless maybe you did like a ton of color studies on the side, which is a perfectly reasonable way of doing it. Um, I didn't do any of that stuff. So I'm figuring it out a little bit on as I go. Now going brighter here does make that high contrast. But I think it'll be okay because, for one, this is going to get busy with light coming through the basket projecting into there. And for two, um, this little stem will show up better if this gets darker. So even though this might be more contrast than I want, I think it'll be okay because of those other factors. But again, that'll just be a problem solved when I get that extra stuff and then I'll, I'll make that determination. I do like that brightness there. Anyway. Okay, so um, the slats, the openings. Uh, it's hard to tell like specific shells going through. The only one that I think is um, a, little, a little important to color match is the urchin shell. And so I'll put a little dot. Uh, that was a really good color mix. Okay, and then I need to feel like it's turning beyond the beyond what I see. And so this will be the shadow version of this shell through here. Hmm. That seems too bright. Yeah. Better. Yeah, that'll work. At least for now. And I don't have to get, I, again, I don't, I don't have to perfect anything yet. I just have to get an idea where I'm going. And uh, that'll help me know whether the basket is working short of perfection. It's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be still somewhat of a block in because I'm going to build the specificity and when I'm ready and I'm not ready, but you know what reads underneath that shell is something brighter. So I can do that. That will also help push the, uh, shadow the urchin seeming a little darker, which I think is going to be nice. And I have to envision this curling through. I might have to fix that a little bit. So continuing this line here, here, and starting to curl up here and then just smooth out that outline. Yeah, cool. Um, and then, you know, I can get away with a lot after that because this is the only one that you can really kind of tell what should be. The rest is a little bit more suggestive. So, I see a brightness in here, but if, if I don't place it at the exact brightness and the exact color, so what? Because it'd be really hard to tell what should be.
Yeah, I'm just trying to think of uh, what the viewer would see. Those people. I know you're thinking to yourself, you mean us? <laughs> also, when you put these uh, black spots, do you use a uh, kind of thick paint? Thicker than what's there. Okay. So I, I, I feel sometimes if I don't use thick paint, then it kind of will get muddy uh, with the, the, the umber joints. And then if it's too thick, then it doesn't look right. Yes, so you, uh, so you, uh, you have to develop a feel, and feel, feel cannot be easy. You have to, you have to develop that over time. And so, uh, one thing that helped me more than anything, I think, is when I couldn't use solvent anymore, because you know Beth was sensitive to it, and so I stopped using solvent, and it really became more about uh, paint management like understanding when the paint was running out and that it's going to start getting weak and then start making mud. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I still make mistakes, but I, I feel like I can problem solve a lot easier. Just understanding that the, the brush will run out of juice. It'll just run out of paint. And then whatever's underneath will start mixing and making mud. But you're right. You know, sometimes you don't want really thick, gobby paint. And the solution to that is not to really glob it on. Like I love thick paint, but I want to be strategic with it. Mm -hmm. But um, the better solution is not necessarily to glob it on, but to do single brush strokes. Right? The brush runs out of juice. Uh, you know, so you're gonna you're gonna have thick paint right here, thick enough to cover that previous layer. But if you do two, three, or four brush strokes, now the brush ran out of paint and now it's mixing. And you can do that strategically too. Like say you want a really smooth transition from here to here. Well, that's not a radical shift in, in color. So if I if I had wet paint here as a midtone and I added bright here, yeah, I could keep moving in volume directions and letting them smash together. But if I had like green down and I wanted to put red on top of it, yeah, if I run out of if I ran out of paint, I'm now I'm making brown. And sometimes that brown can work and sometimes it can't. And uh, I just want to make sure I'm doing it intentionally. But it's a feel. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've been doing this for a long, long time. So the feel for me is because I've done a ton of paintings, I've done a lot of all the prima, um, and I would just I would I would say that's a little bit different than some of like the more academic approach to where uh, you know you almost like you're encouraged to like perfect one painting and then move on to the next. Well, I've done a, a lot of all the prima, which is more of like you know there's that time component. And you got to be very efficient with it and you win some and you lose some and the paintings don't always get developed. And sometimes they, you know, sometimes they turn out okay. But in the meantime, I've figured out different colors. I've figured out different textures. I've different figured out different, um, uh, different designs to figure out textures and, um, you know, because I was able to do uh, different setups and not work one painting to the end of time. Um, but again, I, I want to fall short of criticizing anybody because there's just a ton of artists out there that do really, really great work, but don't do it the way I did it. And um, that work, that way worked for them. Uh, my way is maybe a little reckless in their book. I don't know. Or maybe they're saying the same thing I'm saying. It's like, well, I do it this way, but this other artist does it that way. And that's really great that it works for them. You know? So uh, developing that feel is, is something that's really important to me. Being able to problem solve. Will you have a separate brush just to paint the, the bright spot? No, I don't need it. Okay. <laughs> and well, you're much better. Well... <laughs> 
Okay, but I, I want to fall short that it's like saying I'm good or bad or whatever. It's just I've been doing this for a long time, and I've developed that feel. I, I kind of know whether my brush stroke is going to fully sit on top of that previous layer or whether it's not. And that's really what it's all about is like, does the paint layer mix with what's underneath? Well, that's just a thickness issue. And I love impasto. I just know when to do it. Just a lot of times there's a stage where it's too early. And you can see that I'll do multiple brush strokes within the light, but not when I'm trying to cover over the brown. Yeah, I can I can feel when the paint is running out. And so in here, the shells will be coming through, but up there, it'll be the background. So I have to make sure that I, I distinguish that. And some of these might be a little bit bright. Again, you know, uh, I'm not going to pretend that I always get things right. And I recognize it a lot better if I stop from time to time and evaluate. Because if I'm only looking here, I'll get a, a little a little information. But if I only look here, I won't be seeing how it interacts with everything else. And so um, it's really important to just stop from time to time and just say, okay, what's going on here? How does it compare to everything? Like, does this, does this value even make sense for some of these shells? And I, I'd say for the most part, it's going okay. But um, I know to say that because these are darks, it's very likely that these lights that are coming through aren't as bright as I think they are. They're only bright because of the because of the context. So it, yeah, it, that I agree. Sometimes if I put a really bright spot there, it doesn't look correct. Well, yeah, yeah because you, if you're only looking here, well, that's dark and that's light. But if you look at the whole thing, well, that's not particularly dark and that's not particularly light. But the contrast is making it seem more so than it is, and. Um, you know, just... yeah, I think one, one time I was trying to color match uh, the, the onion that is popping out from the basket, and then that looks too bright. Yeah. So, yeah. We well, see it all the time on the edge of like a nose, on the light side of a nose, because you have like a bright highlight on the bridge and you have a bright highlight on the cheek, and in between it's relatively dark but only relatively so. It's actually not terribly dark. <laughs> and so um, if you don't look at the whole or be able, be able to properly categorize light from midtones from shadows, then you're gonna get it really wrong. And you, you see that all the time with the bright side of the nose. It's like this dark line there that doesn't belong. Same thing with reflected light. If you look in the shadow, you see this glowing, bright, reflected light. But if you compare that light to where the direct light is hitting, it's not bright. It's part of the shadows. Mm -hmm. And it disappears when you squint. And it doesn't belong as a bright. And it kills the three-dimensional volume because it, it's misattributed to a brightness. Um, so contextually, this looks bright, but in reality, it's probably not. And I got to be, I got to be a little cautious here. Um, I'm putting in these lights. I think it's making some of my weaves a little on the skinny side. And I might either make the decision to do less of the slat openings, which I don't really like, or make all the weaves just a little bit skinnier, which is the way I'm leaning. And, um, that might take a little bit of an adjustment. And that's why I said, it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to promise anybody that I'm going to get into the shells today because I'd rather make that problem solve work. And again, I, I just didn't have all the information to make the right decision. So these look too skinny for up here, but to make them wide enough, 
I would lose my negative spaces and I'd much rather have the negative spaces. So I'm going to make all these skinnier. And it's just another, another thing is like, you'll, you'll understand it better when you get more information. And so I, I could have, I could have done the initial block in as like, it all had to be perfect. And I might get to this point and say, oh, darn it. You know, but again, I, I always have it in my head that there's going to be some things to adjust. There's a great line by uh, Anthony Van Dyke that Merger wrote about. And he said, uh, always endeavor to paint your uh, work a la prima. There's always more work to do. Which basically means that the work isn't going to be a la prima. But if you had that a la prima spirit, like you're going to paint very direct, then uh, there's always more work to do. So it's, it's, it's not going to stay a la prima, but you'll be able to problem solve. I'm yet to put the horizontal bands. It's because I, I thought maybe it would be the case that I'd have to trim these and I don't want to work around those. So, uh, it, I'm thinking a couple steps mostly because I've done all this problem solving before. And that's the same reason why, you know, these, this was blocked in very abstractly and then it was refined uh, to a simple level of squint level shape uh, to just slightly more refined problem solving as I go. And then the next sitting, I can get all these tiny little riblets and different colors in there. I can get these little dots that go around the uh, urchin, especially if I can get those little bands going. Like in here, uh, I keyed it up to pretty much pure white, but I want to see these sort of iridescent pinks and greens. And so there should be another round of refinement there. And then like with the, with the weave of the cloth, I'm going to get the big shapes that I see when I squint and then bother to make all those little squares happen and all these little connective little lines and things like that. So working from simple to specific with this idea that nothing's going to be perfect, everything's just going to be suggestive is, uh, you know, again, a, I sound like a broken record, but that's that's the system. That's the that's the way I like to build in paintings. And um, again, I, I fully understand that there's there's some people that would rather work all this out first, and then um, and then get all this sort of intricate stuff in with this idea that you're never going to make a mistake. Which, you know, more power to them. So, Li Jing, I don't know. Were you able to attend last night on uh, Instagram? Uh, uh, what? For the figure? Yesterday? Yesterday? Yes, yeah. Uh, was it didn't last long. I was having such bad time with the internet and uh, on YouTube. The, uh, the, the recording was going just fine, but... Um, the, the face was completely in glare and uh, the painting was taking so long to look like anything. I was painting on top of old dry paint, like old dry uh, figures. And it just looked like madness for the first like two hours. And it was only until the very end that it started pulling this figure out of this madness. And it, it turned out perfectly fine. And I, I liked the way it was progressing from start to finish, but I, I gave up on the recordings. I, uh, I, see. Yeah, you I see ended the session and then deleted it. Yeah. What's that? I, I don't think you were on Instagram yesterday. Um, I was, uh, uh, but I lost the signal probably like four times. All right, what's that? 
only when I actually get there, you already lost the network. Well, I always lose the internet. Well, not always, but I usually lose the internet in that school. I don't know why the Schuler school has such trouble with the internet, but um, if if the signal gets disturbed at all, and usually I can't tell when that happens, if the signal gets disturbed at all, it boots everybody. I see. And uh, that's really frustrating. I, we've got to do something about it. I think it's probably because the uh, signal has to go through an external wall. The studio was built before the house was, and the, it's the house that has the uh, router. And so the signal has to go through an external brick wall to get to the studio. I, see. I don't, I don't know why we can pick up all these other signals in the neighborhood. And I don't know. I don't know if that's fully the explanation or not. It's the only thing that I reason through. And I've been talking to Kyle about how to perhaps get the, like a booster through like, I don't know. I mean, you haven't been in the studio for a while, but do you recall that like the top of the studio has like, um, looks like cemented over windows. Yeah. 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 Well, I was thinking about drilling a hole through the concrete and sending a booster through there so it can have a wired connection into the studio and then maybe we wouldn't have so much trouble. Is that going to be very cold in the winter if we have a hole? What's that? No, it doesn't go to the outside. It just goes to the oh, house. Okay. Like there's a bedroom on the other side of that uh, door. And the only reason that it was a window is because the studio was built before the house was. The studio yeah, was built in... to go outside to connect this home. Right. No, the studio was built in 1903. The, uh, the house was built in 1912. And so um, I think it'll work. But what I don't understand, too, is that, like, uh, on Instagram, sometimes I'll have my phone completely on um, on data. So it shouldn't have anything to do with the Wi-Fi, but I still lose the signal. So I, I don't understand it. Uh, we've got to do something about it. But... Anyway, YouTube YouTube wasn't cutting out. It was just that I just felt like that presentation was bad, so I I, I uh, erased it. The painting turned out fine. I like the painting. Yeah, maybe just send me one photo if you have that. I do have a photo of it. It's <laughs> you'll see, like there's. There's a figure that I did maybe in 2015, give or take. There's a figure. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I say 2015 is because my son was born in 2015 and I stopped doing the figure painting for a long time. When uh, when Beth was in her third prime trimester, I you know stopped doing it so I could stay at home and help. And um, I didn't get back to it until well last year or so two years ago i don't know i can't keep track of time but anyway uh since then i did uh 20 minute paintings of that model john and each new 20 minute pose i painted him with a different skin tone so one of them was like his skin tone was purple and the next one his skin tone was green and the next one his skin tone was blue and yellow and so that was a little weird 20 minute a la prima figure paintings and then on top of that i had uh a painting of monica on top of those figures and now i have this new model of uh, brianna on top of that so it's even even though i like the painting it's a little hard to see <laughs> so <laughs> so you know i like to do those little challenges that that could just be a reoccurring challenge like you know put another figure on top and then another figure on top and another figure on top yeah. so, so try not to be distracted by the, the underpainting right that's easier said than done it was very distracting it was actually hard to make heads or tails of it is for that, like is that a challenge you, you try to uh take like try not to be uh, like disturbed by the underpainting well 
I always discourage students from doing that. Like it's very tempting to paint over old paintings, but I, I usually insist that they um, opaque over it first and let it dry and then do the painting on top. It's like I paint over old paintings a lot for those figure sessions. It's just usually uh, I, like at the end of this sitting, I'm going to have leftover mixing piles. Like all this mixing stuff is usually, I mean, right now I've only been using umber pretty much, but, uh, and background, but normally I have a lot of mixing piles in the middle of my palette and, um, you can save those and then mix white with it and then prime over your, uh, you know, the paintings that you want to cover over. Uh, and it really works well because not only are you saving paint, that's, you know, being frugal, whatever, but frugal isn't really even the point. Uh, not only do I hate wasting paint, but um, also too is that paint is already kind of set up a little bit. It's already kind of drying, so it dries fast. So your 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 ground dries fast, and you get more out of your uh, priming white because you don't have to use nearly as much. You already have a base of color. But also too is like you get a value rather than like white. You know, so if you have a middle value, you're going to guess at your colors and values a lot better. And so um, it's just like for every every good reason there is, uh, using the old paint is something I really, really like. But on this one, I'm sitting here distracted by all the previous figures trying to figure out how to make her come out visually from these other figures. Now I could have opaqued over the other figures, but I kind of like the challenge of keeping them and seeing what happens. So it took quite a long time before you could see anything. And so I just got rid of the video and just didn't, not only that, but the, uh, the face was completely in glare and it would have taken, it would have taken a little bit of time to figure out how to make that work. And yeah, I just, but I'm glad that eventually it worked. Yeah, no, it, it turned out pretty neat. Yeah, that's cool. Liz, you saw it. I did. I did see it. It did turn out well. But it was madness, right? Like, it was really hard to see anything on there for quite a long time. For me, it would have been very confusing. It, it was confusing for me too. It was really confusing. <laughs> but that's not the reason I, I got rid of the video. I got rid of the video because it took so long to develop that, um, you know, that combined with the glary face, I don't know. I just didn't feel like it was, it was good watching for YouTube, especially considering that you lose a lot. You, the attendance drops off really fast on, um, oh, thank you, Rosemary. The attendance drops off really fast on YouTube. Like usually you get like within the first two minutes, you, your attendance drops off really fast on the recorded videos. And um, yeah, that it wouldn't have survived. Like nobody would watch. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now we're, not considering anything perfect or anything completely done or anything, but we've got a good base, a good system of converging lines. Uh, I could do the horizontal bands if I wanted to. What time is it? 10 o'clock? Still pretty early. Um, I do feel like I have to trim these a little bit as just a little bit of problem solve. This edge is made up of little weaves that arc upward here. And then they start arcing this way over near this side. And so I just have to get that perspective right eventually, not necessarily on this sitting. And in here, because my background is darker than in my setup, I'm not seeing all the, like there's a negative space in here that looks really neat, but it's not gonna show up because of contrast because I have my background darker than in my real setup. But that's okay. Sometimes creative decisions get in the way of 
some neat things as long as it's still worth it compared to what you do want to show. And the darker background allows these shells to really pop because there's only so bright you can go. So in order for this shell to have bright sparkly highlights and this shell to have bright sparkly highlights, the rest of the midtones can't be pure white. There'd be nothing to read against. So instead of having the slats, the uh, little openings between the slats um, be bright and high contrast, I think it's still worth it to go dark in the background, even though I lose a little bit of contrast here. So, I mean, yeah, it'd be really neat if, if that could have that contrast, but it's not worth it. All right, so I need to rework some of these weaves. Wish I had gotten a better color match, geez. And then I might just let it go for right now, and I'll do those horizontal bands on another sitting. I don't think it's worth it to do it wet on wet, um, especially for that same idea that if I put these in and I make a mistake, then I can't just wipe them off and go back to my dry painting. So I certainly could do it that way. I just got to ask myself if, if it's so important to do right now that um, it's worth it. And right now I'd say it's not worth it just simply because there's other big areas to block in on this painting. So where are you thinking of going next? These are unresolved. I could get these little cascading bands here. I've got a lot to block in on the top of the weave, especially back here. Um, I've got this base to block in. I could do another round on the uh, iridescent shell. That's looking pretty good. Yeah, it's got, it's got potential. Yeah, so uh, at least on the simple level, I mean, I can still I can still modify things, um, but um, yeah, it's getting there. Just gonna trim these a little bit and then uh, move on to another area of the painting. So right here, my my natural kind of ala prima mindset, I have to talk myself out of it. Fixing, you know, finishing this basket would have a downside of like all the intricacy. I would either have to risk losing it if I made a mistake with the bands. Just not worth it. The other thing I'm going to do is when this dries, I'm probably going to enhance the reflected lights here, which might be a little bit of redraw. And the reason it's going to be a little bit of redraw is that uh, the ones that are on top of this mass of weaves, there's a few that really catch the reflected light boldly. And um, that's going to make a little bit more sense out of this. And I'm just going to be patient with it. I'm going to leave it for now as uh, letting it get dry and then finish it on the other sitting. No rush.
better. I'm going to leave it for now. Might just take a quick second to get back from the painting and just double check some things. But I think it's working for the most part. Soften some edges here. All right, let's see. Ow. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, it's getting there. Yeah. I think it'll look even better with this with these bands that go across. It'll look even better when um, I get the little weaves going on here. There's just no rush for any of that, especially uh, with bigger fish to fry. If it was the only thing left, then maybe I'd say, okay, to get the most out of the sitting, I'll work on it. But I, there's, I'd say that's that's probably a mistake to, to rush it. All right, so There's a little bit of redrawing to do here. I made the decision earlier that if if anything had to happen to this handle, I don't want to increase too much on the top, uh, according to the composition. I would if I had to. Again, the, the, the handle isn't so eye-grabbing that uh, that if I lost a little bit of it, it'd be okay. I'd still rather not lose it. And so there's a lot of reflected light right in here, which I could work out all those little slats, but I don't really have to. So I'm not going to. Just going to keep it about value right now, and then I'll put a, just a little hint of those little uh, weaves when I'm ready. I want the um, I want all this to be a lot less defined than this. but it's still not a priority. So the basket can react to the shells and to the more important weave, at least what I'm defining as more important. And um, did I say the basket? I meant the handle. The handle can react to the more important elements. So I want, I want this handle. I just don't want it to take too much away from what I'm considering kind of the primary elements. I really like this weave. I like the little design that goes through the basket. And I'd rather problem solve off of seeing this visual information and making sure nothing competes with it than developing all this and then feeling like I have to make sure this works for that instead of making this work for this. I don't know if I made any sense there, but, but I'm talking while I'm painting, which to make any sense at all is a big accomplishment.
Wait. Okay, so one uh, one simple rule of these weaves back here is they have to be relatively smaller than these here. And so I want to keep that loosely in mind. I'm not terribly worried about being exact with the with the weave. If I feel like there's something that's really looking wrong, then yeah, I'll refer to the weave just to help problem solve, but Again, this, this can be my version and not verbatim. But I want this to be less intense and smaller shapes as just a simple perspective rule. And um, yeah, for the most part, I don't think that'll be too daunting. I just have to just keep it in mind. Yeah, I think that looks good now. Like I said, I can keep hacking away on this. It's just, uh, I don't think that's the right choice. So I'm just leaving it for, for right now just to work on other areas. And then when it's dry, I can make a lot easier corrections and enhancements. And that's really all I'm worried about right now. Um, just getting that next tier of information and um, I'm willing to let things just go incomplete for right now. And I can block this, this weave in a lot more aggressively because it's just, for one, it doesn't have to connect to the base. Um, it just has to convince people that it's back there, that it's the same-ish weave it's just smaller and less intense and just a suggestion but what i do like about it that i'm not pulling off quite yet is that there's a lot of loss and found like it's just barely suggesting 
reefs back here. I'm overdoing it just a little bit, mostly just because it hasn't gotten very far yet. But that's one thing that's going to be important to me as I feel like I can move on from this spot is uh, making sure that a lot of the weave just runs right together. That defining it more than what I see when I squint is not very important. In fact, they could really harm the painting if everything gets the same amount of intensity. So setting these little expectations can help you make good decisions as you go for sure. But also there's a problem solve to, to do when I can get my eyes back from the painting and decide if it's doing what I'm asking it to. So. I lost a little bit of the basket uh, with modeling the background. And if you were, you were watching um, back then, like I said that out loud, like I don't really want to define the edges of the shells until I like the harmony with the background because I don't want to carefully avoid uh, small intricate shapes. I want to just paint a little freer, thinking about big fields of value and color. And um, the specificity comes much later when I feel like it's worth it, worth doing because it's kind of worked out a little bit. What is that value? Thanks. They're getting a little too thick. I'm going to do something about it. So all this is tentative. I've explained that already. It's just, um, you know, I'm going to keep my eye open for small little changes that are going to make it a little extra whatever. So back here, a little extra subtle. Up here, I'm going to make sure that the, the spaces in between the weaves work all the way around. And then I'm going to get those, those crossing bars get the little details of the weave coming on the rim, which is a little complicated. Um, but there's a time and a place for it. And I'm gonna, I'm really putting off a lot of things till later, just because while I'm on this stage, I can be a little freer. I can be a little bit more suggestive. Sometimes what I think needs more developing doesn't really. And I'm going to make that determination after I can see more information. And 
and um, I'm probably going to move on from this little section pretty quick, pretty soon, pretty quickly. Again, it'd be really helpful to just stand back and just see what it needs. If the relative size doesn't compete with the same weave closer up, like if I if I diminish the size enough, which I'm still kind of working on a little bit, but I get the values wrong, I'm not worried about that. I'll fix the values with a glaze. You're not going to fix size problems with uh, with a glaze. It's just not that's not what glazes do. So. Um, more more concerned about making sure these wheel weaves are tiny compared to these but if it's too bold like if things are standing out a little bit too much and i'd say that they are a little bit i'm not terribly concerned about that it was a good goal to make sure that they are less intense and the contrasts are, are more subtle. But that can just be a half paste away or a glaze. I don't have to get that right. The other reason I don't want to do these little weaves is because they have a system to them. They wrap around individual slats in, in kind of a predictable way. So I want to make sure that works. Not perfectly, but I want to make sure that it makes sense. Times it ten ten almost ten forty. Okay. Gave myself till midnight. So still doing pretty good. Tired now of a headache, but it's all right. Show must go on. <laughs> I, when I can do it, I, from those figure sessions, I'll stay at the school sometimes. Not all the time, but, you know, every once in a while. But I don't sleep well there. The, the city is very noisy compared to Carroll County. And I don't really sleep that well in the first place. So, little sleep. Go till 1130 and then... Well, 
Yeah, I'll consider it, but I, again, I just explained that I've got a little bit of a headache and it's mostly due to sleep deprivation. <laughs> so it's actually kind of good that I'm not doing anything. What's that? I have a lot of sleep Oh, yeah, you do? Well, it helps when you're doing a graduate program. Yeah, it starts from the graduate program and then it's still there. Yeah. I mean, that was almost like a superpower for my master's <laughs> because, you know, I couldn't but really I work on. From the you got from your master's? No, no, no. I've been, I've been an insomniac since I was 15. I'm 45 now. Oh. So it's not something I'm, I'm really that, okay. you know, surprised by, but uh, I don't know. I just didn't sleep well last night and it's on the back of many nights of not sleeping well but i i don't i don't have any chance of sleeping well in the city i used to live there which you know you'd think i'd be able to you know almost like getting back on a bicycle you'd just be used to it but no nope. the big difference between baltimore city and Hampstead, maryland <laughs> yeah i i agree i think baltimore city is really noisy well, I was living there, uh, not so far from the studio. It's like a ten minutes driving. Okay. It's just super noisy, yeah. Now you're not in, uh, you're not in Boston proper, are you? So now I live in Cambridge, which is much quieter than Boston city. Yeah, I'm driven through Cambridge. That's that's yeah, that's nice. Yeah, Cambridge has some nice neighborhood that is not very noisy. Yeah. When we so, went, when we went, we went through the museums and the zoo in Boston and, you know, of course, little places to eat and things like that. And then we went through Cape Cod and that was nice yeah. too. Yeah, I haven't been to Cape Cod. It's very famous for the, light, the house, lighthouse, right? Yeah, in uh, Provincetown? Yeah, I, I think a lot of uh, artists did the outdoor painting there. Yeah, no, there's artists everywhere. There's like little galleries and it was, it was really great. Loved it. But there's a lot of good galleries there. Like um, Collins Gallery is there. And um, oh gosh, I'm not even remembering them anymore. That was so long ago. But uh, I really liked the uh, Collins Gallery. And uh, the one that we were in uh, was in Salem. I hope they're still there. That was, uh, no, not Salem, uh, Marblehead. And um, it used to be in Salem. I think actually when we visited, they were still in Salem. Okay. But um, that was like the sort of driving factor behind going there. But it was, you know, mm -hmm. it's always great to see cities that you haven't been to, great cities like Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a great trip. I, I really liked it there. Got to see the Gardner Museum and the Boston Museum of Arts, and yeah, those are great. Yeah. So, and there's some smaller ones nearby. I've never been to. I've heard about them. Yeah, we went to some of the smaller ones. Um, the galleries, not museums. Um, mm -hmm. Got to see some of some of a uh, really really great artists. Yeah. Really nice town. Mm. Seeing El Haleo is so nice. The sergeant painting in the gardener. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, in the gardener and also the Museum of Fine Art, they have a good collection of sergeants. Yeah. So that was Is that uh, I mean, not right here, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm more of a 
night owl than anybody in the family. I'm not a night owl because that would also imply that I don't have to wake up early. <laughs> I'm just sleep deprived. That's all. <laughs> I get you can only say night owl if uh, if you sleep in. I really don't. <laughs> just, just don't sleep much at all. I just don't. Sleep. It's very unhealthy. I know. Like everyone can tell me all the salient points behind getting more sleep. I get it. I've heard them. <laughs> now, the big downside for me is just headaches. I usually muster all the energy that I need to for any given moment, like driving or, you know, interacting, getting to class and stuff like that. Mm. My biggest deal is I get headaches, but and then I know I better, I better dedicate some time to sleep. But then it's um, not even a matter of dedicating the time. It's actually doing it, which that's easier said than done for me. It's like, there's some nights that just doesn't matter. I'm not, it, it just doesn't work like that. <laughs> you can be as tired as can be and still not be able to sleep. Yeah, I understand that happens to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I cannot fall asleep. And then when it reaches a certain threshold, I become very sleepy all day. <laughs> right. And you'd think that would translate it out into like your head hits the pillow and you're instantly asleep. But it just, for me, it doesn't do that. <laughs> And I've, you know, I've quit caffeine and I've, I've done super intensive workouts to try to, you know, and yeah, some of those things help, but you yeah, still have to be functional the next time. That's what people said. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the other thing is like, I've quit caffeine several times, but, um, usually when I do, well, I can't say usually, I, but. A lot of times I've had just kind of a loose correlation with quitting caffeine and getting gout. Mm. <laughs> and that's not fun. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing fun about gout. I think sometimes caffeine helps to relieve the headache. Absolutely. Well, yeah, especially that's if. one of the main reasons why I'm still getting them. Oh, because you quit caffeine? Uh, I, no, I. If because it helps with the headache. If I don't drink much caffeine, then my headache becomes more severe. And that's not fun. There we go. I really yeah. like this enthusiastic support for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and then even if I don't drink, uh, I don't take in any caffeine, it, it won't help me to sleep better. So <laughs> I just quit. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the same for me too. Yeah, so I, I would rather to, um, to take in some caffeine to help deal with my headache. Otherwise, yeah, it's just being terrible. <laughs> well, that's speaking my language right there. Oh, yeah. I think I was too stressful in the grad school and somehow it just screwed up something. <laughs> Well, thing is with my master's, like I really couldn't do any of the reading or the assignments until the kids were asleep. Mm -hmm. And so it was a good thing that like, if I had to, if I had to do high, high concentration work until three in the morning, so be it, I could do it. Um, but that's no excuse now because I've been out of that program since, uh, what was it? May. And it's not like I had to do what I did. I mean, I, I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily saying I had to get a four O in order to feel good about what I was doing. It's just, I really liked the assignments and they were really pertinent to what I'm doing with uh, building like curricula and things like that. So 
that was more to it than feeling like it had to be an A or something. So there's still some little problem solves to do on the weave. I'm encouraged by the way it's blocked in. And the little push and pull can happen pretty easily on the next sitting, especially as I add more elements and see how necessary they are. So like some of these dark lines up here are not actually going to be dark lines. They're going to be light lines. It's just a matter of like, is that the big priority right now? And I'm determining that it's not. But like that, any edge that faces toward the left is going to be a bright line. Any edge on the right is going to be a shadow. Unless it... So are you going to let them dry before you uh, put the, the highlight and the shadow there? Yeah, I think so. Just because okay. there's bigger fish to fry. So I could do all that all la prima. I mean, I can control the paint pretty well. Um, like I said, develop that feel for uh, thickness of paint and how it's going to make the drawing line on top. I don't have to think about that at all on dry painting. Like if it's dry, anything that I put down is going to stick on top. Because by just definition, something is more than nothing. So if I'm painting wet on wet, it it takes a little bit more concentration, and that's not really even the big deal either. It's just a matter of efficiency. So uh, if if I do it on this sitting, I've got to be slow and meticulous because I have to be more conscious of the paint load or problem solved where I can't really just wipe out. I'd have to be a little bit more careful in the way that I, I fix problems. And so like there's little there's little drawing errors to fix, not errors. I, I really don't like using that word until we're at the detail stage, but some of the weaves don't, you know, truly make sense as far as the thickness goes. Some of them got cut in too much by the, the little negative spaces. I still don't have that, those little bands going across. So I, I think the better solution is just to wait on that. And it'll get more accurate as I add more shapes. So I'm just going to keep getting things that are on pretty low level of completion like this. It would be nice if I went ahead and mapped out the diminishing sizes of the shell. I could even get that highlight in place. Like I just made a little drawing error. That, yeah, so I made a little, that wasn't worth keeping. <laughs> so that's how easy it is when, when you have a dry surface. So trying to fix it here, wet and wet, it's not daunting. It's just not worth it. Now, having said that, I just wiped it out instead of doing the drawing correction first. I was just making a silly example. What I just did wasn't wiping out. What I, that was just uh, the paint got a little thick. And I uh, just wiped it back a little bit. Some of these lines are not dark lines. They're actually light lines. But if I can just draw uh, and not worry about value so much, I don't know, it just makes the process simpler.
these curves ought to be getting a little flatter and a little smaller the higher up they go. As my eye level is right around here on the urchin, right around here on that little spike. So just knowing that helps me look for it. I mean, I could do all that on the abstract level, but knowing what to look for helps. And it helps with the problem solve. And again, the, the values are way off because some of these are dark lines, some of them are light lines, and none of them are particularly either because the highlights are really bright. And anything that gets too bright on here other than the highlight will be distracting. And anything that gets too dark, as opposed to the cast shadows or darker elements of the composition will be too dark. So again, this is just kind of preliminary line work that I'll alter as I go. But this is a good first step. And then I'm reaching a little bit because mostly because of the camera. If, if I didn't have the camera here to contend with, I would be in a better position to make the brush work. But I enjoy having the camera and I enjoy having you all with me. So it's worth it. <laughs> that doesn't work right here. And so even though I know how to make it happen theoretically and by abstraction, you know, I don't always put things where they're supposed to be. But I know how to recognize it when it's not working. And I'm just going to do a little problem solve. Again, keeping my old lines. Better. So now, now that I got rid of the old lines, I can, or now I, now that I put in the new lines, I can get rid of the old lines. Yeah, we're working with the photo on Instagram of the chat. It looks very shiny. It is very shiny. It's just I didn't get to it on the secondary blocking. Mm -hmm. That I would have if if this didn't take so long. Like I spent almost all my time on these two, and a little bit of time on these two. I just ran out of time for this. There was no. Oh, what was that? There was no need to rush. It was just like you know, what? I'm not gonna get to it. Not gonna happen. And there's some light coming through the basket and the dipping the, the shell at the back. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't well, wait to get to that. <laughs> yeah, like I said, all in due time. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. What was that? Something fell in my studio. I have no idea. Anyway, um, yeah, there's a lot of cool elements in this painting. Like the lace is cool too. It's just tedious. And it's it's exciting when it first starts. And then it's really, really, really unexciting for a long time. And then you finish it and you're like, yeah, yeah I did it. And I'm never doing that again. And then do it again. At least that's how I've that's how I've done it too many times. <laughs> I think maybe some other people would be a little bit more disciplined in saying I'm never doing that again and sticking to it. I don't I don't know what has compelled me to do it so many times. And here I am doing it again.
it's just really, really, really not fun. <laughs> Or maybe this time it will. Seventh time's a charm, right? Sixth time? I don't know how many times I've done least. I did one that was really small. That that wasn't so bad. But uh, The first one was probably the most intricate. The second one was uh, either the biggest or second biggest. The third was definitely the most pressure. That was the live contest. And then the other ones, yeah, like this one is going to be recorded and watched live and stuff like that. So I guess there's a little bit of pressure to get it right, but I don't know. I think it's just as instructed to hear about the mistakes and the problem solved than it is for me to just get everything perfect. So we're not going to pretend I'm going to get everything perfect. I'm actually happy to, to point out when there's something that could have been done better and what the problem solve is. Is that too? Yeah, that's about right. It'll be okay. So I'm going to go ahead and get this practically white, but I might actually tone it down on the next sitting with a glaze. I just want to see it. And so, um, again, I'm not going to glob it on. I like putting a lot of thick paint in my uh, brightest lights. And this is in the conversation of brightest lights, but I, I'm probably going to play it down a little bit. So I don't really want ridges of paint. So I'm going to put these in. I'm going to tap them with the paint rag to knock them down a little bit just so they're not too thick. And I'd rather do that than a blending brush just because blending brushes can drag the paint too much. But I just want to see it. It's going to help me make more decisions. And I don't really have to be thick for this to be bright. Because I'm not, it's not very thick paint that I'm painting over. So I probably don't even need to do the tapping down, but I'm, I'm going to anyway. My ellipses weren't perfect. But even just this little touch up here, like I can round it out just a little bit more. So sometimes I'll bother to, to redraw until I get it right. Sometimes I'll just fix it with the next shape. But there's neat little pinks and things in here. There's neat little tans. And, um, you know, the darks aren't particularly dark. So what I might do on the next sitting is take just a series of glazes and um, introduce some more colors, soften some of the darks, and, um, and then just paint into it with opaque paint. Eventually, I might get some impastos in these highlights but it's a little too early for that. If you get an impasto in a wrong spot, it's not like you can't fix it. It's just sometimes that texture of the paint can read in the raking light. Like say you got a gallery light and you, you painted over a texture note. Uh, it can catch light and look a little funny. And I don't, I don't like that. So if I can avoid putting impasto in the wrong spot. When, when the, there is a pattern of the, the thickness of the, the paint, and that can cast shadow. <laughs> yeah, when it's really thick. Yeah. One time, uh, my brother and I went to uh, the Forum Gallery in New York, and we saw this show by Stephen Assail, and he was doing the, 
these great, I mean, they're awesome paintings. They're just great big paintings of like a subway series of like the New York subways and uh, really great paintings. Some of those impostors actually casted their own shadows. It was so thick. Like the paint, the paint was like truly three dimensional. It was really neat. Yeah, that, that's cool. Sometimes uh, even the those uh, older impressionism, yeah, when they use very thick paint, but it's um, a pretty structure. Yeah, I mean, that, but you know, you can go back to like Konstantin Makovsky. Like some of that, some of his impostors were super duper thick. Um, who else? Uh, Fortuny. Um, I know, I'm sure a few more names are going to come to mind. Rubens had some thick impostos. Rembrandt did. I mean, those I guys. Know. Hall's kept his little thick, uh, thinner, but those are just like, these super expressive slashes of paint that were placed perfectly, you know, uh, all of that, all that factors in like it just in the wild variety of what artists can do with paint, really fun stuff. Yeah, this show now looks great through the camera. Yeah, that's probably what it looks like from stepping back from it, which I, I have to remind myself to do when I'm demonstrating. I'm really good about it when uh, I'm just painting for myself, but for some reason, just demonstrating, I don't get it up enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it does look good on, uh, on the camera. Yeah, it's looking really great through the camera. Yeah. You know, this is the way my grandmother painted. Uh, at least when she was in her like eighties in her nineties, she had really bad vision problems and, uh, it still looked great. But, um, in her eighties, the paintings were spectacularly loose, but they looked tight from a distance. So mm -hmm. from right here, if I, if I got the camera, in fact, I can, I might lose my light a little bit, but if I bring the camera up. You see that those are just really disconnected brush strokes. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. But from here, it comes together, <laughs> which, you know, I think everybody should just develop the habit of getting back from their work because things might work on a level before they tighten it all up, and they'll lose some of that that nice characteristics. And it, I, you know, I, I'm saying other people. I mean myself. I need to do that too. Um. Because if you get back and it comes together, it's very likely that you don't actually have to tighten it up in, um, you know, at all. So again, I, I don't really feel like I need to complete this. I can I can work on other things. And I want to introduce like pinks and uh, tans and things. I already have some tans in here, but um, a lot more color variety that I can kind of glaze in and then react to it and then adjust and all that stuff. So that's I'm probably going to put this aside for right now and work on something else. Bigger fish. But yeah, uh, yeah, I'm happy with that. Just want to soften the edges of the highlights and I thought I was going to do that with the paint rag I might just do it with this little brush but if I was going to do it with the paint rag again I'm not going to drag it I just tap just keep everything where it is and just relieve the volume of paint so it doesn't leave a texture and that's, that's enough. But it's going to get a lot more variety. I, but I, I, yeah, I like the way it looks on the screen. I liked it even more before I tapped some of that 
uh, paint off of it. But again, I don't want to leave the ridges quite yet. And so I'll just probably bring it back to that level. All right. Um, I want to get some of these little bands of like red and gray and tan before I add the little dots. I'm also going to get the edge of the opening uh, with those little highlights and little grays to show the plane changes. And then what kind of time do we have? 50 minutes before midnight. Yeah, I mean, midnight is a little arbitrary, but yeah, it's like give or take. So this is a different type of glaze. That's way too dark. To where I'm not going to do my normal method of putting it on extra bold and then scaling it back. I'm going to go for about the value that I see. I'm going to keep it really thin. My normal method of glazing is just put on super bold and then, you know, I'm just determining the properties. Do I want it darker? Do I want it redder? Do I want it warmer? Whatever, right? Just whatever properties I can put my description on, I'll just way overdo it. And then I'll scale it back with the paint rack. So that would look something like... Like this, but I feel like this is a little too weak. So if you scale it back from what you want, you almost lose it completely. But if um, if you way overdo it and then scale it back with the paint rag, uh, you know it'll just generally influence the drawing underneath. This is more meant to be turning with the form that was already established, but. Um, you know, a little bit more specifically. You would do that for like a, a shirt that has a pattern on it. You could do it for a tattoo. You have the figure already worked out underneath and you just want the tattoo to get lighter and darker with the turning form. Like a Delft vase, like it has maybe the windmill pattern on it. Uh, if you had the the vase already established with all its values, then you can just draw that pattern on top and it'll get lighter where the, where the sub layer is lighter and it'll get darker where the sub layer is darker. If you have reflected light, it'll change color with the reflected light. And all you have to do is just draw as if this was a piece of charcoal. And um, that's kind of what I'm doing here. It says little stripes that I want to turn from light to dark. And um, I don't really want to constantly change the value to exactly what needs to, how it needs to turn. So I'd rather paint it without the stripes and then superimpose the stripes on with glazes. And then I'll put the little urchin little dots on top. And it'll be highly textured. It'll pull off the impression, hopefully. And if it doesn't, then I'll have plenty of information to react to to make it exactly what I want. At least in my mind's eye. <laughs> So I've covered a lot of ground today, but mostly because, you know, I don't have to finish this yet. Just had to get kind of close. In fact, that I see some things that I really want to improve. 
think the same thing that I was talking about with this shell be so much nicer to not compete with any kind of intensity of these dark lines. So I'm just going to tap it. I'm going to shift to a different part of the paint rag so I don't start stamping like it picks up the paint and then spreads it. And so I'm just turning to a different spot of the paint rag and lifting up some of that paint. It already did its job. And I'm going to be redrawing on top just ever a little slightly bit. You know, I'm going to turn the form. Might even start with some glazes first and then come in and solidify the drawing and get the detail. So not all of these stripes are going to be red. I'm just, since red is on the brush, I'm going to complete this idea out and then uh, shift to maybe a gray and there are stripes that are already there that was like that middle tone so sometimes you just have to pick which which one which one value do you want to keep so if i had painted everything red then i'd have to draw those grays in but i felt like the gray was the biggest uh kind of sub layer and so i just picked i picked the gray i'm superimposing the red so i overdid that and just like before, I'm going to scale it back a little bit better. It's very subtle, but I'd rather paint the texture on top of these stripes rather than vice versa. I determine if I even need the gray stripes. Just wanted to take a little moment to think. Yeah, I think they'll help. They're almost not even there. I see just the slightest hint of them. Ah, they'll look, they'll look good, especially with all the busyness. So next sitting, next sitting, I'll, I'll T-square all this out uh, and then uh, draw that pattern in. Now I'll refine this. I'll get those crossbars. I don't know when I'll get to the little dots on here, but uh, it'll be thoroughly dry by the time I paint on it again.
this shell needs a lot more refinement. Well, I would, okay, not a lot more, but it needs more refinement before I put these little stripes of red on them. That the red looks good. It's worth doing. It's just gonna be te it's gonna be hard to do. It's gonna be tedious. Um, maybe not as much as the lace. So that's why I hesitated to say that word. It's like relative to what? To the lace? No, it's not gonna be tedious compared to the lace. <laughs> Lace is uh, really, uh, I don't know. I guess there's people more patient than I, but it can really be monotonous and slow. It's not like it even requires much uh, like planning or anything. Just a lot of it gets just to be simple, busy work. I'd say that's the case for a lot of detail paintings. It's not like it's difficult. It just, it just takes a long time. And if you're willing to put in that time, then you'll have these impressive little detail paintings. And uh, the world will think, oh my gosh, how did they do that? It's really just, you put down a million brush strokes and it looks busy and, and impressive. It's not, it's not as difficult as getting things uh, I'd say it's not as difficult as pulling off a really good loose painting because you have to do so much more with less. But it does look good. Usually. Like lace. One of the first things I did with this urchin shell was just see if there was a recognizable pattern. Like, you know, red is surrounded by gray. This is the spacing, things like that. I don't have to perfectly adhere to it, especially not when the dots get on there. It's just nice to start there. Again, if, if I can just think about the pattern, then I don't know. I think it's just one extra little consideration, but the, uh, honestly, is anybody going to look at it and say, okay, I know urchin shells. It follows this exact pattern. Well, no, but most things like, uh, like the shell has a system to it. And so I'm just trying to give it a system. It's not like I have to get it right. It just has to be believable. But all the all the busyness is going to make these stripes pretty subtle. 
because um, like each row has a sequence of little bumps. Some of the bumps in this area cast little shadows. The ones in here don't. And I'll be taking a mental note of that when I get to it. And then we'll talk about diminishing sizes. So these are a little closer to me and those are a little further away. And so they're catching different light and they're diminishing in size with perspective. And so those are just little tiny considerations to make while I build this up. Like right in here. Yeah, I'm going to put the pattern in, but uh, it can start diminishing in intensity. Just because it's getting further away and it's getting more saturated with light. So again, just knowing to look for that stuff. Uh, helps. Now that's too dark. Are you going to put thick paint for the bumps? We'll start with a little, uh, maybe a little on the conservative side. Okay. And then I'll see what it needs. It would be a good candidate for bumps. So I think, yeah, I think so. But, you know, I don't, I don't really have to um, start with thick paint. I can, I can see how it looks with just a value exchange and then um, play it by ear. I, I have a feeling that I'm going to go with thick paint. Now, let's say I overdid this pattern. Then all I would do is do a little half paste on top. So let's just say I, I was drawing this in and um, I needed it more subtle. Well, the half paste does that super easy. So a film of maybe an off white, like maybe even a little yellow in there, it would, uh, it would subdue all this stuff in a haze. And I could still glaze on top if I felt like this needed to turn more. I don't really think it does. But I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking out loud about the options of what if, you know, sometimes even you think it's working, but when you come back with a fresh eye, it's not working as well as you thought. A lot of times it's the opposite too. It's like sometimes you think, oh man, I really have to fix this on the next sitting. You come in with fresh eyes and it's like, it's better than I thought. <laughs> Perception, perception and mindset really have a big deal to do with the, the way you see your painting. Or, okay, I'll speak for myself on that one, but it definitely makes a big deal for me. If, I, if I'm not feeling my painting, a lot of times I'll ascribe like success or failure to it based on how I feel, not necessarily what's really there. I'm not really that big of an emotional painter. There's some people that are really have to, you know, take a small mental break to get their focus back. I just grumble until I get it right. <laughs> uh, actually, Beth and I have the exact opposite uh she had to be convinced a lot of times to finish her paintings that were going really well, but she didn't like them. And they turned out great at the end. Me, I just got like, you know, battle to the death with these paintings that just were not working. And I probably should have stopped and just, you know, given up on the painting. In hindsight, I still feel like that, even though, <laughs> you know,
you know, I pushed through and got to a finished product that was okay. It just, in the end, it wasn't worth it. Okay, 11.30. Don't want to get into a section that would take a lot of time or concentration. I'm going to do a little glaze work that will enhance it again I don't I don't like my darkest darks being in the background but I still feel like this can be one of my darkest darks that in the cast shadow these shadows have a ton of glow to it because the shell is translucent and it's projecting its light it was yeah it's projecting the light into the shadow so it's got this like incredible like peachy glow in that cast shadow. It's really neat. So it's kind of blocked in that way, but I feel like it could be more enhanced. I'm only putting this in now because for one, it requires low concentration and it's pretty quick. But for two, it, it's going to be a big impact on how I see, for one, the basket for that next sitting. And for two, the shells, which if this were grayer, less chromatic, and a little bit darker, the shells would be brighter and more vibrant. And I talked about the background earlier saying that I really like the glow down here. I like this brightness. So that could be the reflected light bouncing off of the um, cloth. But if I say that, then I might have to put some cast shadows back here. I think that'd be good anyway. It wasn't really on my radar to start with of making sure that like the table was anywhere near the wall. But uh, just simple uh, weak shadows back here might actually be nice to fill the negative space just a little bit without being too eye grabby. Well, at least that's to, to be determined. If I put it in and it does grab the eye too much, then I'll reduce it. But I mean, look how bright that can get with a darker background. You just have to know where to fade it. Right about here, I just kind of lose that glaze.
That's a little bit glare in the in YouTube. Oops. Zoom did something funny. I can't really even trying to get my image to be the biggest on the screen and every time I hit it it's doing nothing it's just shifting around I think you can ping yourself right I can I just yeah. have pain on my fingers I was hoping to do it the <laughs> fast and <laughs> and not get pain all over my phone <laughs> Yeah, I like that darker. And so I mentioned maybe going from dark to light and lighter as I go down toward the lace. That's sort of what's happening now. It's still a little blotchy. And I can I can finesse that a little bit. But kind of like the decision. Right there got a little too dark, and instead of trying to work that out, I'm just going to lift it. Huh. That didn't lift too well. All right, I'll have to go opaquely over that little, there's a streak in there that isn't going away. means opaque. Fortunately, I still had some background mixed up. Nice. So I'm losing that point of the shell a little bit. I'll, I'll recover that. Usually probably with a glaze. All right. So that was nice. What else? Got 22 minutes. Could go ahead and take the T square. I don't, I think that would be forgivable if I didn't have that on recording just taking a t-square to the table edge i don't know i don't think that necessarily has to be on anything um here i can take a brush and throw it across the room apparently all right so in here just going to take the thinnest of glazes and cut into the edge of some of these highlights, some with green and some with pink. And then there's a few just little darker areas that I think would be nice to get uh, just a little definition on. And if I overdo it, then I can half paste it again. So it's just back and forth between glazes and half paste. And the shapes are getting smaller and more intricate with each sitting. That I can leave alone. This could go darker. All 
That's too dark. That background is looking really good and everything's pop popping against it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I like hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> Although I don't know if I'd hear it if you're like, oh, that background looks terrible. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, what were you thinking? <laughs> Of course, I'd appreciate that too. All right. So, I don't know. Like I said, I've got a pretty wicked headache. And I'm just going to finish this thought out and probably be done for the day. Um, even if I don't get all the way to midnight. Normally speaking, I'll say I'm a, I'm gonna paint till midnight and I'm there till like two in the morning. <laughs> so this is the other this is the other option. This makes up for some of those days. But yeah, I want some of these highlights to have that rich, rich pink, almost like watercolor to where this brightness is coming through. This almost nothing bale of paint and giving it that, hopefully, that iridescence that I'm looking for. And so I'm just putting in pink right now. And I'll go back to green. On the um, on the camera, this doesn't show up very well. Well, okay, maybe on maybe on Zoom, but on YouTube, this wasn't showing up very well. It's pretty washed out. There's a ton of greens and reds and uh, sort of hazy pink, uh, peach and uh, you know colors like that. And that was one of the things that attracted me to this show in particular is this has crazy iridescence. And that is really tough to get in an oil paint. Well, okay, I would say probably any painting, but uh, I'm doing oil paint, so I'm saying oil paint. And so. Let's say for right now, those greens are showing up a lot more. The reds are showing up a lot more. And I get, again, it's because of the, um, that almost pure white base coming through transparently and, and brightening it from underneath, which is, um, one of the better ways of getting really intense colors uh, that are on the darks, the, when the pigments are really dark, to make them bright, uh, you can you can have that sub layer of almost white, if not pure white. So these were these were just about pure white.
Yeah, I didn't think I'd get to this. I thought the Basco weave would take a lot longer, and it really could have if I decided to do more to it. But uh, I think it went well for this sitting to leave alone for the next sitting. And, um, you know, working on all these, that was all bonus. It was nice to be able to get to. Okay, so pretty soon I'm going to wrap it up for the night, but I'm really, really glad to have you join me. And I hope it was a little educational and a little entertaining. 
There it was both. Thank you. Oh, yeah, this is sorry. No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> See, it, it went from both of you talking to none of you talking. <laughs> I'm waiting for this to say something. Oh, no, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's good to watch since I'm also doing the basket one. Yeah, really but like, your your basket is pretty different from this one. But yeah, yeah no, they. And I think uh, you will be doing the lace tablecloth soon, right? And yeah. My mine also has a small piece of lace. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah no that's right yeah the uh, um yeah i mean this is this is really busy but it has a it has a rhythm it has a kind of anatomy to it the mm. thing is anytime my drawing gets a little off i could turn it into a ripple as long as the scale works at least a little bit um but i want to i'm gonna bring this uh closer to the camera i wonder if it's better to bring the camera to it but um you can see how the colors are influencing the highlight values i think the i think the highlights need just a little half paste and i'm going to do that on this sitting right into those glazes and bring some of the highlights together but they'll get they'll get a little bit of that color in there as long as the values get um, just maybe a little bit more pulled together right near these highlights, and then I'll, I don't know, I might even do another round just to bring it together one more time, but it's coming along. I mean, it's, everything's kind of progressing the way I anticipated with the caveat of saying that I know there's problem solving to do with every painting. And so, um, it's it's ideal when the problem solves move the needle forward instead of making it about correction more about enhancement and uh that's that's not always the case you know you you're gonna you're gonna make decisions that don't work sometimes but if if it's just moving from simple to specific making decisions along the way i find that a lot more uh satisfying than then wiping out and going back to a lack of clarity, which is probably the reason I made a mistake in the first place. So again, we're, we're just building, 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 and hopefully not undoing too much. But I, I definitely could have had more of a plan, you know, so what? All right, so um, here, how about I pull the, Painting closer to the cameras, and you can see some of the colors maybe a little bit better. But like the weave isn't perfect, but it's another step closer. Jeez, now I can't, I can't get the camera to focus. Why? Um, how am I going to do this? All right. Um, there, that's closer for that camera. And with YouTube, whoops, camera fell. There, that's better. It'd be even better if I could block the bright light behind it. Here, I can do that. I can move this over. Yes, better. Uh, it still has a little bit of glare issues, but you can see where I'm going. And hopefully the camera the camera seems a little washed out on that iridescent shell. Like the colors in there are pretty crazy, um, in in all the right ways for what I want. And this shell is simpler than it looks. And so the basket, I'm going to do a series of glazes. I'm going to do a series of uh, refinement with small brushwork. And the urchin shell, I really like that subtle pattern on it. So I'll do the little dots on top, the little bumps. 
And then the whole bottom, I'm going to take a T squared of this table. Might not record that, but I'm not hiding that I use a T square. I think it's silly when people say, oh, you can't use that. It's cheating. Well, <laughs> no, that's, that's using tools. Just like saying a brush would be cheating. But um, the uh, I don't do straight lines particularly great, and I didn't really spend much time getting that straight. So I'm going to use T square. Um, I'm going to just make sure there's no any kind of weirdness to this. So maybe give it a very light sanding and then a glaze and let that dry. And then I'm going to put that pattern on top. You can see that the pattern has um, some big flat areas and then it has the hole. So anything that has the holes, I'm going to um, I'm going to be a little generous with the openings at first, and then weave the edges with precise brushwork. And um, and then weave all those little little connections. And I've done it many times before, so I'm pretty sure that system will work just fine. And I'm encouraged by this sitting. I mean, got a lot done. Uh, but further sittings are going to feel like it's going to get less and less and less, right? Because the brushwork gets smaller, everything gets slowed down. And uh, yeah, there might be a point where you're not going to want to watch. It's just going to be monotonous and slow. You say that's not the case, but. <laughs> It's it's really going to go nowhere fast for quite a long time on that weave. It's just going to be little sections at a time, pulling it together and stuff. Much better sped up on a camera. But thanks for joining me. I'm going to be done. So um, I, I will try to give enough warning for the next one. And just if you miss them, they'll, they'll be on the live part of my channel on YouTube. And then... When this whole thing is done, I'm going to pull it all together and dub over it with a cohesive message from start to finish. No kind of rambling like I'm doing with you all or joking around. It'll be a nice presentation of this painting. So uh, you won't miss anything, even if you can't make it live. So I hope to see you live. But if not, yeah, you can always catch up. OK, well, good night, everybody. And uh, good night. Good night. Thank have, you. have a great rest of the weekend. You too. Okay. Good night, everybody. I'm on. Good night. Bye. Bye.